Story 1 It all started innocently enough. A casual friendship with a co-worker named Tom. We chatted during breaks, shared the occasional lunch, and exchanged harmless jokes. I never thought much of it, especially since Tom seemed friendly and harmless. But looking back, there were signs I should have noticed, subtle warnings that something wasn't quite right. Tom began showing up at places I frequented outside of work. At first it was the coffee shop near my apartment, then the grocery store where I shopped every Saturday morning. He always had a reason for being there a new place he wanted to try, errands he needed to run, but it was starting to feel like more than coincidence. One evening as I was leaving work late, I found a note on my car windshield. You looked beautiful today, it read. There was no signature, but I had a sinking feeling it was from Tom. Trying to be polite and avoid confrontation, I brushed it off as a friendly compliment, even though it made me uneasy. Over the next few weeks, the notes became more frequent and more unsettling. I love the way you smile, one said. Another read, I think about you all the time each time I found a note. My heart would race and I'd look around, hoping to catch a glimpse of him, but he was never there. Then came the night I saw him outside my apartment. It was late around midnight and I was getting ready for bed when I heard a noise outside my window. Peeking through the blinds, I saw Tom standing on the sidewalk, staring up at my window. My blood ran cold. He was holding another note, but this time he didn't leave it on my car. He simply stood there, watching, until I closed the blinds and called the police. When the officers arrived, Tom was gone. They took my statement and assured me they'd patrol the area, but I could tell they didn't take it seriously. He hadn't done anything illegal, after all. He was just being creepy as one officer put it. But I knew it was more than that. Tom's behavior was escalating, and I was terrified of what he might do next. I started taking different routes to and from work, altering my routine in the hopes of throwing him off, but it didn't help. He always seemed to find me, his notes becoming more desperate and erratic. Why are you avoiding me, one demanded. We're meant to be together, another insisted. The final straw came when I found a note inside my apartment, despite having changed the locks. I'll always find you at red. I felt violated, knowing he had been inside my home. Desperate and scared, I went to my boss and explained the situation. She was sympathetic and agreed to transfer Tom to another location, but it took weeks for the paperwork to go through. In the meantime, I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, couldn't eat, couldn't focus on anything but the fear that consumed me. One night, I woke to the sound of footsteps outside my bedroom door. I froze, listening as they moved slowly, deliberately, stopping just outside my room. My heart pounded so loudly I was sure he could hear it. I reached for my phone, but it wasn't there. I must have left it in the living room. Summoning every ounce of courage, I crept out of bed and grabbed a heavy lamp for protection. As I tiptoed toward the door, the footsteps retreated. I peeked out and saw nothing. The front door was wide open. I must have forgotten to lock it in my panic earlier. I called the police again, and this time they took my fear more seriously. They increased patrols in my neighborhood, and I filed for a restraining order. Tom was finally transferred, and I hoped the distance would make him lose interest. For a while, things seemed to get better. I stopped finding notes, and I didn't see him lurking around anymore. But the peace didn't last. One evening, I received a text from an unknown number Miss me my blood ran cold. How had he gotten my new number? I had changed it after the restraining order, trying to put as much distance between us as possible. I contacted the police again, but they said there was little they could do without concrete evidence of harassment. The restraining order was in place, but it seemed like just a piece of paper against someone as determined as Tom. I started noticing small things around my apartment being moved, 
even though I always locked the doors and windows. A book out of place, a picture frame turned slightly askew. It was as if he was trying to remind me that he could get to me whenever he wanted. One night, as I was coming home from work, I saw him. He was standing at the end of my street, just watching. My heart raced, and I quickly went inside, double locking the door behind me. I called the police, but by the time they arrived, he was gone. My life became a nightmare. I was constantly looking over my shoulder, jumping at every noise. I felt like a prisoner in my own home. Friends and family suggested I move, but I couldn't afford to break my lease and start over somewhere new. I felt trapped. Then came the night he broke in. I woke to the sound of breaking glass and knew immediately that it was him. I grabbed my phone and locked myself in the bathroom, calling 911 as I heard him moving through my apartment. I'm here he called out, his voice sickeningly sweet. We need to talk. The police arrived in record time, and I heard them shouting at him to get on the ground. There was a scuffle, and then silence. An officer knocked on the bathroom door, telling me it was safe to come out. They had him in custody. Tom was arrested and charged with stalking and breaking and entering. I got a restraining order that actually seemed to work this time, and he was sentenced to time in jail. It wasn't a long sentence, but it was enough for me to finally move, change my name, and start over in a new city. I still look over my shoulder, and I still have nightmares about those days, but I'm slowly reclaiming my life, one day at a time. The fear doesn't control me anymore but the memory of it lingers, a reminder to always trust my instincts and never take my safety for granted. Story 2 I've always loved hiking. There's something deeply satisfying about the solitude and the connection to nature. So when I heard about a remote forest trail that few people knew about, I couldn't resist. It was supposed to be untouched, a place where you could hike for days without encountering another soul. Perfect, I thought, for some much needed peace and quiet. I set out early one Saturday morning, backpack loaded with supplies, ready for a weekend adventure. The drive to the trailhead took me deep into the countryside, far from the hustle and bustle of city life. When I finally arrived, the air was crisp, and the forest seemed to welcome me with open arms. The first day was everything I had hoped for. The trail was challenging but manageable, winding through dense woods and across clear, bubbling streams. I spotted deer, heard the calls of distant birds, and felt more at ease than I had in months. By late afternoon, I found a suitable spot to set up camp, pitched my tent, and settled in for the night. The next morning, after a quick breakfast, I packed up and continued my hike. The deeper I went, the more rugged the terrain became. It was exactly the kind of challenge I craved. As the hours passed, I noticed the forest growing quieter. The usual sounds of wildlife were strangely absent, replaced by an eerie silence that I tried to ignore. Around midday, I decided to take a break and eat lunch. As I sat on a fallen log, I felt an odd sensation like I was being watched. I scanned the trees, but there was nothing unusual. Shaking off the feeling, I continued on, determined to reach a small lake I had marked on my map. A few hours later, I stumbled upon something that made my blood run cold. Hidden behind a thick curtain of foliage was a campsite. But it wasn't just any campsite. This one looked like it had been there for a long time, perhaps even years. There was a makeshift shelter made of branches and tarps, a fire pit surrounded by logs, and various tools and supplies scattered around. What struck me most was how meticulously it was all arranged. This wasn't a casual camper's site, it belonged to someone who knew how to live off the grid. As I walked around inspecting the area, I found more unsettling signs. There were canned goods stored neatly in crates a hunting rifle propped against a tree, and even a stack of notebooks filled with detailed entries. Curiosity got the better of me, and I opened one of the notebooks. 
The handwriting was neat and precise, chronicling daily activities, observations about the weather, and notes about the forest's flora and fauna. But then I saw entries about people, hikers like me, who had passed through. The writer had noted their appearances, their gear, and sometimes even their conversations. The last entry was dated just a few days ago and described a lone hiker me. Panic set in. Someone had been watching me, tracking my movements. I had to get out of there. I quickly put the notebook back and turned to leave, but as I did I heard a rustling in the bushes behind me. I froze, my heart pounding. Slowly, I turned around, expecting the worst. A man stepped out of the shadows. He was tall, with a scruffy beard and piercing eyes. He looked as startled as I felt, but there was something menacing in his gaze. What are you doing here, he demanded, his voice low and rough. I'm just hiking, I stammered, trying to keep my voice steady. I didn't mean to intrude. He studied me for a moment, then glanced at the campsite. You found my place, he said, more to himself than to me. I don't like people poking around. I'm sorry, I said quickly. I'll leave right now. He took a step closer, and I instinctively backed away. You've seen too much, he muttered. I can't let you go. My mind raced, trying to think of a way out. I considered running, but he was blocking the only clear path. Just then, I remembered the emergency whistle in my backpack. Without hesitating, I grabbed it and blew as hard as I could. The shrill sound echoed through the trees, startling the man. For a moment he looked unsure, and I seized the opportunity. I shoved past him and ran. Branches slapped at my face and arms, but I didn't care. I just ran, following the trail as best I could. Behind me, I heard him cursing and crashing through the underbrush. I didn't stop until I reached a small clearing where the trail split in two directions. Gasping for breath, I took a moment to get my bearings and chose the path that seemed most likely to lead back to my car. I knew I had to keep moving, but my legs felt like lead. As I stumbled down the trail, I heard footsteps behind me again. I risked a glance over my shoulder and saw the man, closer now, his face twisted with anger. Desperation gave me a burst of energy, and I pushed myself harder, ignoring the burning in my lungs and legs. Finally, after what felt like hours, I saw a familiar landmark, a large boulder I had passed on the way in. My car wasn't far now. Summoning the last of my strength, I sprinted the final stretch. When I reached the trailhead, I fumbled for my keys, my hands shaking. I could hear the man getting closer. I managed to unlock the car and threw myself inside, slamming the door just as he emerged from the woods. I started the engine and sped away, not daring to look back. As I drove, my mind raced with questions. Who was that man? Why was he living out there? And what would he have done if he'd caught me? It took me a long time to feel safe again. I reported the incident to the authorities, but they found no trace of the man or his campsite when they searched the area. For months, I had nightmares about being chased through the forest, always hearing his footsteps behind me. Now I stick to more populated trails and always hike with a friend. The memory of that hidden campsite and the survivalist who had been watching me still haunts me. A reminder of the dangers that can lurk even in the most peaceful places. Story 3 Moving into my new apartment felt like a fresh start. After a messy breakup and a job transfer, I was eager to leave the past behind and build a new life. The apartment was cozy, situated in a quiet neighborhood, and had everything I needed. I quickly settled into a routine, enjoying the peace and privacy. For the first few weeks, everything was perfect. I got to know my neighbors, explored the nearby cafes and parks, and began to feel at home. Then one morning I found an envelope slipped under my door. At first I thought it was a misplaced piece of mail, 
but my name was written on it in neat, block letters. Curious, I opened the envelope and pulled out a single sheet of paper. The message was brief, but chilling I see you my heart skipped a beat. It had to be some kind of prank, I told myself. Maybe one of my neighbors had a strange sense of humor. I decided to ignore it, hoping it was just a one-time thing. The next day, another envelope appeared. This one was more detailed I saw you at the cafe yesterday. You wore a blue dress. It looked nice on you panic set in. Someone was watching me, tracking my movements. I looked around my apartment, feeling exposed. I double-checked the locks on my doors and windows, making sure everything was secure. I tried to go about my daily life, but the letters kept coming, each one more disturbing than the last. They described my routines in detail what time I left for work, where I shopped for groceries, the route I took when I went jogging. The writer seemed to know everything about me. I went to the building manager and showed him the letters, but he just shrugged. Probably some kid pulling a prank, he said dismissively. If it keeps happening, call the police frustrated and scared, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I installed the security camera outside my door, hoping to catch the person responsible. The camera recorded everything, but days went by without capturing anything unusual. The letters continued to appear, always while I was out. I became increasingly paranoid, constantly looking over my shoulder, jumping at every noise. I barely slept, the fear gnawing at me. One night, I was jolted awake by a loud bang. I jumped out of bed and grabbed a kitchen knife, my heart pounding. Creeping to the door, I peeked through the peephole but saw nothing. The hallway was empty. I checked the camera footage, but it showed only static. Someone had tampered with it. I called the police, finally convinced I needed their help. They arrived quickly and took a report, but without any concrete evidence, there was little they could do. They promised to patrol the area more frequently, but it didn't make me feel any safer. I felt trapped, a prisoner in my own home. The next morning I found another letter. This one was different. It wasn't just a description of my activities, it was a threat. You can't hide from me. I'm always watching. If you tell anyone, you'll regret it. I felt sick to my stomach. Whoever this was, they were escalating. I took the letter to the police again, but they seemed more concerned about my mental state than the actual threat. Are you sure you're not imagining things? One officer asked gently. I wanted to scream. I wasn't crazy. Someone was stalking me and I was terrified. Desperate for help, I confided in my neighbor, Sarah, a sweet older woman who had always been kind to me. She listened sympathetically and offered to let me stay with her for a few nights. I gratefully accepted, packing a bag and moving into her guest room. It was a relief to have someone to talk to, someone who believed me. Sarah was a godsend. She cooked meals, talked with me late into the night, and helped me feel safe. For the first time in weeks, I started to relax. The letters stopped coming, and I began to think maybe the nightmare was over. Then, one evening, while Sarah and I were watching TV, there was a knock at the door. Sarah got up to answer it, and I followed, my heart racing. A man stood there holding a bouquet of flowers. Delivery for Lily, he said, smiling. Sarah looked confused and turned to me. Do you know this man? I shook my head, feeling a chill run down my spine. No, I didn't order any flowers. The man's smile faded and he looked disappointed. Are you sure they're for you? I stepped closer, trying to get a better look at his face. Something about him seemed familiar, but I couldn't place it. Who sent them, I asked. He shrugged. No idea. I'm just the delivery guy. He handed me the flowers and walked away. 
Sarah and I brought the bouquet inside and I hesitantly pulled out the card. My blood ran cold. Found you at red. See you soon, I dropped the card, my hands shaking. Sarah called the police, and they arrived quickly, but again there was little they could do. The delivery had been paid for in cash, and the man who brought it was just doing his job. They promised to increase their patrols and advised me to stay with someone I trusted. I couldn't believe this was happening. How had the stalker found me at Sarah's place? I decided it was time to take drastic measures. I packed my belongings and moved in with my parents, several states away. It was a tough decision, leaving behind my new life and job, but I couldn't live in fear any longer. My parents were supportive and understanding, helping me get back on my feet. I found a new job and slowly started to rebuild my life. The letters stopped, and for the first time in months, I began to feel safe again. But the experience had changed me. I was more cautious, more aware of my surroundings. It took time, but I eventually moved into another apartment, this time in a secure building with 24-hour security. I made sure to never settle into predictable routines and always stayed vigilant. The memory of the stalker's letters still haunted me, a constant reminder that evil can lurk even in the most unexpected places. Story 4 It was supposed to be an ordinary day. I was heading home from work, exhausted and looking forward to a quiet evening. The building where I lived was old, but the management had recently installed a new elevator, claiming it was safer and more reliable. Little did I know, that elevator would become the setting for one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. I stepped into the lobby, waved at the doorman and pressed the button to call the elevator. As I waited, a man entered the lobby. He was tall with unkempt hair and a disheveled appearance. Something about him seemed off, but I shrugged it off, attributing my unease to a long day at work. When the elevator doors opened, we both stepped inside. I pressed the button for my floor, and he pressed one a few floors below mine. The doors closed, and the elevator began its ascent. We stood in uncomfortable silence, the hum of the elevator the only sound. Suddenly, the elevator jolted and came to a screeching halt between floors. The lights flickered, then went out, plunging us into darkness. Panic set in immediately. I fumbled for my phone, turning on the flashlight to illuminate the small space. The emergency light came on a moment later, casting a dim, eerie glow. Looks like we're stuck, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. The man didn't respond. He just stood there, staring at me with an intensity that made my skin crawl. I pressed the emergency button, explaining the situation to the building's security. They assured me help was on the way, but it might take some time. Minutes passed, feeling like hours. The air in the elevator grew thick and stifling. I tried to make small talk, hoping to ease the tension. So do you live in the building, I asked. He finally spoke, his voice low and unsettling. No, I'm just visiting. His answer did little to comfort me. I noticed his eyes were darting around the elevator, as if he were planning something. I inched away, trying to put as much distance between us as possible in the confined space. Then, without warning, he lunged at me. I barely had time to react as he grabbed my arm and tried to wrestle me to the ground. Instinct kicked in, and I fought back with everything I had. I screamed, hoping someone outside might hear, but the thick walls of the elevator muffled my cries. His grip was ironclad, his eyes wild with a manic intensity. He threw me against the wall, knocking the wind out of me. I struggled to regain my footing, kicking and clawing at him. My mind raced, searching for anything I could use as a weapon. My phone slipped from my grasp, clattering to the floor and the flashlight blinking off. 
In the dim emergency light, I saw a glint of metal, a small tool left by the maintenance crew in the corner of the elevator. Summoning all my strength, I broke free from his grip and scrambled for it. My fingers closed around the cool metal, just as he reached for me again. With a desperate cry, I swung the tool, catching him across the face. He screamed in pain, staggering back. Blood trickled from a gash on his cheek. Seizing the moment, I pressed the tool against his throat, my hands shaking. Stay back, I shouted, my voice echoing in the confined space. He hesitated, eyes wide with a mix of anger and fear. For a moment I thought he might back down, but then his expression hardened. Before he could move again, the elevator jolted back to life. The lights flickered on and the doors slowly opened, revealing a group of security guards and maintenance workers. They rushed in, pulling the man away and restraining him. I collapsed to the floor, gasping for breath, tears streaming down my face. The police arrived shortly after, and I gave my statement, recounting the harrowing ordeal. The man was taken away in handcuffs, his eyes never leaving me as he was escorted out of the building. The police assured me he would be charged with assault and held accountable for his actions, but the fear lingered. That night, I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw his face felt his hands gripping me. The elevator, once a mundane part of my daily routine, had become a symbol of terror. I couldn't bring myself to use it again, opting for the stairs no matter how many flights I had to climb. In the days that followed, the building management upgraded the security system and installed cameras in the elevators. They apologized profusely, offering to move me to a different apartment, but I declined. Moving wouldn't erase the memory of what happened, and I was determined not to let fear control my life. I started seeing a therapist to help process the trauma, learning techniques to cope with the anxiety and nightmares. It was a long, difficult journey, but with time I began to heal. I grew more cautious, more aware of my surroundings, but I refused to let that day define me. Now when I step into an elevator, I take a deep breath and remind myself that I'm stronger than my fears. That experience changed me, but it didn't break me. I survived, and that knowledge gives me the strength to face whatever comes next. Story 5 The open road has always been my escape. Whenever life became overwhelming, I would pack my bags, hop in my car, and drive. The sense of freedom, the miles of asphalt stretching out before me, offered a solace I couldn't find anywhere else. So after a particularly stressful few months at work, I decided to take a solo road trip through the back roads of the country, far from the noise and chaos of the city. The first few days were perfect. I drove through picturesque landscapes, stopped at quaint roadside diners, and slept under the stars in remote campgrounds. It was exactly what I needed. On the fourth day, I found myself on a long, isolated highway that cut through a vast desert. The sun was setting painting the sky with hues of orange and pink, and I felt a deep sense of peace. As the darkness settled in, the road became eerily empty. I hadn't seen another car for hours. The only sounds were the hum of my engine and the occasional rustle of the wind. I was miles from the nearest town, but that didn't bother me. I enjoyed the solitude. Then, out of nowhere, headlights appeared in my rearview mirror. At first, I didn't think much of it. It was just another car on the highway. But as the minutes passed, I noticed the car was getting closer, its headlights growing brighter. I sped up a little, not wanting to be overtaken on such a desolate stretch of road. The car behind me matched my speed, maintaining a constant distance. A knot of anxiety formed in my stomach. I tried to shake it off, telling myself it was just another traveler, but a gnawing fear began to take hold. I sped up again, this time significantly, hoping to lose them. To my horror, the car accelerated too, closing the gap. 
My heart pounded in my chest as I realized they were chasing me. Panic set in and I pressed the gas pedal to the floor, my car roaring down the highway. The car behind me followed suit, its headlights now blindingly bright in my mirrors. I desperately searched for any sign of civilization, a gas station, a rest stop, anything where I could find help, but the road stretched on, empty and unforgiving. My mind raced, trying to figure out my next move. I couldn't keep this up forever. My fuel gauge was dropping, and I knew I'd have to stop eventually. I spotted a dirt road branching off the highway and made a split-second decision. I swerved onto it, my tires kicking up a cloud of dust. The rough terrain jolted my car, but I kept going, hoping the driver behind me wouldn't follow. But when I glanced in the mirror, my heart sank. The car had followed me onto the dirt road, relentless in its pursuit. The road twisted and turned and I struggled to maintain control. My hands were slick with sweat and my breaths came in short, panicked gasps. The headlights behind me seemed even closer now, a constant reminder that I couldn't escape. As I rounded a sharp bend, my car hit a pothole, causing it to swerve wildly. I fought to regain control, but the car skidded off the road and came to a shuddering halt in a ditch. I was momentarily stunned, my mind reeling from the impact. I looked up to see the other car stopping a few yards away, its headlights illuminating the night like a pair of sinister eyes. The driver's door opened, and a figure stepped out. I couldn't make out any details, but their silhouette against the headlights was enough to send a wave of terror through me. I fumbled with my seatbelt, my fingers trembling, and managed to unfasten it just as the figure began walking toward my car. I scrambled out of the passenger side, my legs weak and shaky. I had no plan, no idea what to do next. All I knew was that I had to get away. I stumbled through the darkness, the sounds of my pursuer's footsteps growing louder. I darted into the scrubby desert brush, hoping to lose them in the shadows. My heart pounded in my ears as I ran, the uneven ground threatening to trip me with every step. I could hear the pursuer crashing through the brush behind me, relentless. Desperation fueled my movements, but my body was growing tired. I spotted a rocky outcrop up ahead and made a beeline for it, hoping to find some cover. I squeezed into a narrow crevice, trying to control my breathing. The footsteps grew closer, then stopped. I held my breath, straining to hear over the sound of my own heartbeat. After what felt like an eternity, the footsteps resumed, moving away from my hiding spot. I waited, counting the seconds, until I was sure the person had gone. Slowly, cautiously, I emerged from my hiding place and looked around. The car was still parked on the road, but there was no sign of the driver. I knew I couldn't stay there. My car was stuck, and I had no way to call for help. I started walking, keeping to the shadows, my eyes scanning the darkness for any sign of movement. Every rustle, every distant sound set my nerves on edge. Eventually, after what felt like hours, I saw lights in the distance a small town. Relief washed over me and I quickened my pace, though I remained vigilant. I made it to the town's outskirts and found a gas station. The attendant looked up as I stumbled inside disheveled and out of breath. Are you okay? He asked, his eyes wide with concern. I shook my head, unable to find the words. Someone dot someone chased me, I finally managed to say. He immediately called the local sheriff, who arrived shortly after. I recounted my ordeal, and they assured me they'd investigate. They offered me a place to stay for the night, and I gratefully accepted, too exhausted to continue. The next morning, the sheriff informed me they had found my car and the other vehicle abandoned nearby. There was no sign of the driver. They promised to keep an eye out, but without any leads, there was little they could do. I decided to cut my road trip short and head home, still shaken by the experience. 
The drive back was nerve-wracking, every car on the road a potential threat. It took time, but I eventually began to feel safe again. The open road, once my sanctuary, now holds a darker memory. I still love to drive, but I'm always cautious, always aware of the dangers that can lurk in the shadows of the highway. The memory of that chase, the relentless pursuit, serves as a reminder that even in the vast emptiness, you are never truly alone. Story 6 I've always been a light sleeper, sensitive to the faintest sounds or slightest movements. On this particular night, I woke up abruptly, my heart pounding as if I had been startled awake. At first, I lay still, trying to shake off the grogginess and make sense of the darkness around me. Something felt off, a chill ran down my spine, and I sensed an unfamiliar presence. I blinked a few times, allowing my eyes to adjust to the dim light seeping through the curtains. That's when I saw him, a stranger, standing at the foot of my bed, shrouded in darkness, silently watching me. My breath caught in my throat, and a wave of terror washed over me, paralyzing me for a moment. He didn't move, didn't say a word. He just stood there, his outline barely discernible in the gloom. My mind raced, trying to comprehend how he had gotten into my apartment. The door was locked, the windows secured. How long had he been standing there, observing me in my most vulnerable state? I forced myself to stay calm, taking shallow breaths to avoid drawing his attention. I needed to think clearly, to figure out a way out of this nightmare. Slowly, I shifted my gaze towards my nightstand, where my phone lay. If I could just reach it, I could call for help. But the slightest movement might alert him, and I had no idea what he was capable of. Gathering my courage, I moved ever so slightly, trying to inch my hand towards the phone. The stranger's head tilted slightly, and I froze, my heart pounding in my ears. He took a step closer, and I could see the faint glint of his eyes in the darkness. They were cold and unfeeling, devoid of any emotion. Who are you? I managed to whisper, my voice trembling. He didn't respond. Instead, he took another step closer, and I felt the panic rising again. My mind screamed at me to do something, anything, to protect myself. I considered my options, none of them appealing. I could try to scream, but there was no guarantee anyone would hear me. I could try to run, but he was blocking my path. As he moved closer, I caught a glimpse of something in his hand, something metallic that reflected the faint light. A knife. My blood ran cold. I had to act, and fast. Without thinking, I grabbed the nearest object, a heavy lamp on my nightstand, and swung it at him with all my strength. The lamp connected with his shoulder, and he staggered back, letting out a low grunt. I didn't wait to see what he would do next. I bolted out of bed, adrenaline fueling my movements. I sprinted towards the door, my only thought to escape. I heard him recovering behind me, the sound of his footsteps quickening. I reached the door and yanked it open, tearing down the hallway towards the front door of my apartment. My hands fumbled with the locks, my fingers trembling uncontrollably. I glanced over my shoulder and saw him approaching, his expression now twisted with rage. Finally, I managed to unlock the door and threw it open, stumbling out into the hallway of my building. I screamed for help, hoping desperately that someone would hear me. Doors began to open, concerned neighbors peeking out to see what was happening. The sight of other people seemed to stop him in his tracks. He looked around, realizing he was outnumbered, and without a word, he turned and fled back into my apartment. I collapsed against the wall, sobbing with relief as my neighbors rushed to my aid. The police arrived shortly after, and I told them everything. They searched my apartment, but the stranger was gone. He had vanished as mysteriously as he had appeared. The only evidence of his presence was the broken lamp and the lingering fear that hung heavy in the air. 
In the days that followed, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Every creak of the floor, every rustle of the wind outside my window set my nerves on edge. I changed the locks, installed additional security measures, and even moved to a different apartment, but the sense of violation remained. Sleep became a luxury I could no longer afford. I spent my nights tossing and turning, haunted by the memory of those cold, emotionless eyes. My friends and family tried to comfort me, but the fear had taken root deep inside me, a constant reminder of the danger that had invaded my sanctuary. It took months of therapy to begin to reclaim some semblance of normalcy. I learned techniques to manage my anxiety to feel safe in my own home again. But the memory of that night, of waking to find a stranger standing at the foot of my bed would never fully fade. Even now, years later, I still sleep with a light on and a security system that alerts me to the slightest movement. The trauma of that experience changed me, made me more cautious, more aware of the vulnerabilities we all face in the places we feel safest. But it also made me stronger, more determined to take control of my life and my safety. The stranger never returned, and the police never found any leads on his identity or how he had managed to break into my apartment. He remains a shadow in my past, a reminder of the thin line between safety and danger, between normalcy and chaos. And while the fear he instilled in me may never completely disappear, I refuse to let it define me. Story 7 Taking a job as a night security guard at an abandoned warehouse seemed like a good idea at the time. I needed the extra money, and the thought of spending quiet nights watching over an empty building didn't seem too daunting. The warehouse was on the outskirts of town, a massive structure that once buzzed with activity but now stood silent and forgotten. My first night started uneventfully. The company gave me a flashlight, a set of keys, and a walkie-talkie. I was to patrol the building every hour and report anything unusual. The warehouse was cavernous, filled with the remnants of its past a few broken crates, discarded machinery, and thick layers of dust covering everything. As I walked through the dimly lit corridors, my footsteps echoed eerily, amplifying the loneliness of the place. The only sounds were the distant hoot of an owl and the occasional rustle of a rat. The building was divided into several sections, each with its own set of locked doors and hidden corners. I made a mental note of the layout, trying to familiarize myself with the place. Around midnight, I decided to take a break. I sat in the small security office near the main entrance, sipping on a cup of lukewarm coffee. The silence was comforting, almost soothing. But then, just as I was starting to relax, I heard a noise of faint thud coming from somewhere deep within the building. I grabbed my flashlight and set out to investigate. The sound grew louder as I approached the warehouse's central area. My heart pounded in my chest as I rounded a corner and saw a door slightly ajar. This door had been locked when I checked it earlier. I pushed it open cautiously, my flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. Inside, I found what appeared to be an old office, papers and folders strewn about haphazardly. A quick glance at the documents revealed something unexpected. They were records of shipments, invoices and other paperwork detailing activities that had taken place long after the warehouse was supposedly abandoned. My curiosity peaked, I dug deeper finding ledgers that hinted at illegal transactions, drug shipments, illegal arms, and other contraband. My pulse quickened as I realized the warehouse wasn't as abandoned as I had been led to believe. Someone was still using it for illicit activities, and I had stumbled upon their secret. I snapped a few pictures with my phone, documenting the evidence, and decided it was time to leave and call the authorities. As I turned to leave, I heard another noise, a low, ominous creak followed by whispers. I froze, my flashlight trembling in my hand. The whispers grew louder, 
and I realized they were coming from the adjoining room. I inched closer, my heart racing, and peered through a crack in the door. Inside, a group of men huddled around a table, discussing something in hushed tones. Their faces were obscured by shadows, but their intentions were clear. They were planning something illegal, and I was right in the middle of it. I stepped back, trying to remain silent, but my foot hit a loose piece of debris, sending it clattering across the floor. The whispers stopped abruptly. Panic surged through me as I heard footsteps approaching. I turned off my flashlight and slipped into the nearest hiding spot, a small alcove behind a stack of old crates. The footsteps grew louder, and I held my breath, praying they wouldn't find me. Two men entered the room I had just vacated, their flashlights sweeping through the darkness. I swear I heard something one of them muttered. Probably just a rat, the other replied, though his tone was less than convinced. They lingered for a moment, then moved on, their footsteps fading into the distance. I waited a few more minutes, making sure they were gone, before cautiously emerging from my hiding spot. My mind raced as I tried to formulate a plan. I needed to get out of there and call the police, but I had to be careful. If they caught me, who knew what they would do? I retraced my steps, sticking to the shadows and avoiding any areas where I might be seen. As I neared the main entrance, I heard the men's voices again, this time coming from the loading dock. I peeked around the corner and saw them unloading crates from a truck, confirming my suspicions about their illegal activities. Finally, I reached the security office. I grabbed my phone and called the police, speaking in a low whisper to avoid detection. They assured me that officers were on their way and instructed me to stay hidden until they arrived. Minutes felt like hours as I waited, every creak and groan of the old building making me jump. I kept my eyes on the entrance, ready to make a run for it if necessary. Then I saw the flash of blue lights outside and heard the sound of sirens approaching. The men at the loading dock scattered, trying to escape but the police were quick to surround the building. I emerged from my hiding spot and ran to meet the officers, explaining what I had found. They moved in swiftly, arresting the men and securing the evidence. The next few hours were a blur of statements and questions as the police pieced together the illegal operation. It turned out the warehouse had been used by a local gang for years, hidden in plain sight. My discovery had brought their activities to an abrupt end. The company I worked for was shocked and apologetic, offering me a different position in a safer location. I accepted, grateful to be away from the warehouse and its dark secrets. The experience left me shaken, a stark reminder of the dangers that can lurk in the most unexpected places. To this day, I'm wary of taking jobs in isolated locations, preferring the safety of more populated areas. The memory of that night of being chased through the dark corridors of the abandoned warehouse still haunts me. But it also taught me the importance of vigilance and the courage it takes to stand up against the unknown. Story 8 I had been looking forward to this business trip for weeks. It was an opportunity to showcase my skills, network with industry professionals, and hopefully secure a promotion. The hotel I booked was well-reviewed and conveniently located near the conference center, making it an ideal choice. I checked in late in the evening after a long flight, eager to unwind and get a good night's sleep before my presentation the next morning. The room was standard but comfortable, with all the amenities I expected. After a quick shower, I climbed into bed, exhausted but satisfied with the day's progress. The next morning, I woke early to go over my presentation one last time. I made some coffee and set up my laptop at the small desk by the window. As I worked, I noticed something odd. There was a small, blinking light hidden among the decorative flowers on the desk. My heart skipped a beat as I realized it was a camera. I stood up quickly, my mind racing. Who would put a camera in my room? How long had it been there? I scanned the room, 
suddenly feeling exposed and vulnerable. I checked the bathroom, the nightstand, and even the TV, but the camera on the desk seemed to be the only one. Trying to stay calm, I carefully unplugged the camera and placed it in a drawer. I dressed quickly and went down to the front desk, carrying the camera with me. The clerk looked up with a polite smile, which faded as I placed the camera on the counter. I found this in my room, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Can you explain how it got there? The clerk's eyes widened, and she immediately called the manager. A tall man with a stern expression arrived a few minutes later, glancing at the camera with a frown. I'm very sorry, Mom, he said, picking up the camera. This is extremely concerning. We'll investigate right away. That's not good enough, I replied, my anger rising. How did this get into my room in the first place? What if there are more cameras? I want an explanation. The manager assured me they would check the room thoroughly and offered to move me to another room. Still shaken, I agreed, but I insisted on staying to watch as they searched my original room. They found nothing else, but the experience left me unsettled. The new room was on a different floor, and I checked it thoroughly before settling in. Despite the manager's reassurances, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I double-checked the locks on the door and windows and kept the blinds closed. The conference went well and my presentation was a success, but I found it hard to focus. My thoughts kept drifting back to the camera and the implications of its presence. That night, I barely slept, jumping at every sound and shadow. The next morning, I went down to the lobby for breakfast. As I sat eating, I noticed a man at a nearby table watching me intently. Our eyes met, and he quickly looked away, but something about him felt off. I tried to dismiss it as paranoia, but my unease grew. I finished breakfast and headed back to my room, glancing over my shoulder to see if the man was following me. The hallway was empty, but the feeling of being watched persisted. I locked the door behind me and checked the room again searching for anything out of place. Later that day, I met with the manager again, demanding an update on their investigation. He seemed genuinely concerned, but had no answers. The camera was not hotel property, and they couldn't determine who had placed it in my room. They offered to cover my stay and compensate me for the distress, but it did little to ease my mind. As the conference drew to a close, I decided to cut my trip short. The hotel arranged for an early checkout, and I booked an earlier flight home. The sense of relief as I boarded the plane was palpable. I just wanted to put the whole experience behind me. Back home, I reported the incident to the police and provided them with all the details I had. They promised to look into it, but I knew the chances of finding the person responsible were slim. The feeling of violation lingered a reminder of how easily my privacy had been invaded. In the weeks that followed, I became more cautious. I invested in a device to detect hidden cameras and made it a habit to thoroughly inspect any room I stayed in. The incident changed how I viewed my surroundings, making me more aware of the potential dangers lurking unseen. The hotel's management reached out a few times to check on me and update me on their internal investigation, but nothing conclusive ever came of it. I appreciated their concern, but it did little to quell the sense of unease that had settled over me. Even now, when I travel for work, the memory of that hidden camera haunts me. I've become more vigilant, always on guard, always aware that someone could be watching. The experience left a mark, a constant reminder that privacy is a fragile thing, easily shattered by unseen eyes. And while I've learned to cope with the fear, to move forward despite it, I know I'll never forget that feeling of waking up in a strange place, only to realize that someone had been silently observing my every move. Story 9 Exploring abandoned places had always been a thrill for me and my friends. We loved the adrenaline rush that came with stepping into the unknown, the sense of adventure that accompanied every creaky floorboard and darkened hallway. 
So when we heard about an old, abandoned factory on the outskirts of town, we couldn't resist. It was supposed to be huge, filled with forgotten machinery and remnants of its industrial past, perfect for our next exploration. It was a warm Saturday afternoon when we set out. There were four of us, Mark, Lisa, Alex, and me. We parked a few blocks away to avoid attracting attention and made our way through overgrown paths and rusted fences until we reached the factory. The building loomed ahead, its windows shattered and walls covered in graffiti. Despite its derelict state, it held an eerie beauty, a testament to a bygone era. We entered through a gap in the fence, our flashlights cutting through the dim interior. The factory was massive, with long corridors, sprawling rooms, and staircases leading to unknown levels. We split up, agreeing to meet back at the entrance in an hour. Mark and Lisa went one way, while Alex and I took another path. The air inside was thick with dust, and the only sounds were our footsteps and the occasional drip of water echoing through the silence. We passed rows of rusted machinery, conveyor belts frozen in time, and offices filled with decaying paperwork. It was fascinating and unnerving all at once. Half an hour into our exploration, we stumbled upon a section of the factory that looked more recently disturbed. The floor was littered with trash, empty food cans, and old blankets. The smell of smoke lingered in the air. Alex and I exchanged uneasy glances. It was clear that someone had been living here. As we moved further into this area, we heard voices low and indistinct at first, but growing louder as we approached. Panic set in. We weren't alone. I gestured for Alex to stay quiet, and we ducked behind a stack of crates, listening intently. Did you hear that a gruff voice said? Probably just rats, another voice replied. No, it sounded like people. My heart raced as the footsteps grew closer. We needed to get out of there, but the way back was blocked by whoever was coming. I motioned for Alex to follow me, and we quietly made our way deeper into the factory, hoping to find another exit. The voices continued, now joined by the sound of more footsteps. We were being hunted. Every shadow seemed to conceal danger, every noise amplified our fear. We navigated through dark hallways and up a flight of stairs, trying to stay ahead of our pursuers. We reached the second floor and found ourselves in a large, open space filled with old storage units. It was there that we saw them a group of squatters, their faces hard and unfriendly. They spotted us immediately, and the chase began. Did them one of the squatters yelled, and they rushed toward us. Alex and I ran, darting through the maze of storage units, our hearts pounding in our chests. We heard shouts and the sound of heavy boots behind us. Desperation fueled our movements as we searched for a way out. We turned a corner and found a door marked stairwell. We burst through it and started descending the stairs two at a time. Behind us, the squatters were getting closer, their voices filled with anger. The stairwell echoed with our frantic steps and the pursuing sounds of our hunters. As we reached the ground floor, we slammed into Mark and Lisa, who had been running from a different direction, their faces pale with fear. They're everywhere, Lisa panted. We need to find a way out. We ran together, searching for an exit. The squatters had the main entrances covered, and we were forced deeper into the labyrinth of the factory. We found a narrow corridor that led to a small, rusted door. Alex pushed it open revealing a dark, narrow passage that seemed to lead outside. This way Alex urged, and we squeezed through the narrow opening. The passage was tight and filled with debris, but we pushed forward, the sound of our pursuers growing fainter behind us. We emerged into an overgrown courtyard surrounded by high walls. The only way out was through a small, half-collapsed gate. We scrambled towards it our lungs burning and legs aching. As we neared the gate, we heard the squatters behind us again, shouting and cursing. We pushed through the gate, stumbling into the open air. 
We didn't stop running until we reached the safety of our car. We collapsed inside, gasping for breath, our bodies shaking with adrenaline and fear. Mark started the engine, and we sped away, leaving the factory and its dangerous inhabitants behind. As we drove back to town, the reality of what had just happened began to sink in. We had come face to face with people who had nothing to lose, who saw us as intruders in their territory. The thrill of exploration had given way to a sobering lesson about the dangers that can lurk in forgotten places. We agreed to take a break from our urban explorations, the memory of that day too fresh, too raw. The factory, once a symbol of adventure and mystery, had become a place of fear and danger. We had narrowly escaped, and the experience left a mark on each of us. Even now, the thought of that abandoned factory sends a shiver down my spine. The memories of running through its dark corridors pursued by men who wanted to trap us still haunt me. It was a stark reminder that some places are abandoned for a reason, and not all adventures are worth the risk. Story 10 It was a stormy night, the kind where thunder shook the house and lightning illuminated the sky in jagged streaks. I was alone, as my family had gone out of town for the weekend. I relished the solitude curling up with a good book and a cup of tea, enjoying the sound of the rain lashing against the windows. Around 10 p.m., the power went out. I wasn't too concerned at first power outages were common during storms in our rural area. I fumbled for my phone to use as a flashlight and grabbed the candles I had set aside for such occasions. The flickering candlelight cast eerie shadows on the walls, but I found it oddly comforting. I decided to check the circuit breaker in the basement, hoping to restore the power. The basement was always a bit creepy, even on the best of days. It was unfinished, with exposed beams and a dirt floor in some areas. As a child, I had been convinced monsters lived down there. Now, as an adult, it still gave me the creeps, but I brushed aside my fears and made my way down the creaky wooden stairs. Halfway down, I heard a noise of faint rustling, like someone shifting in the dark. I paused, holding my breath, listening intently. The sound stopped. I told myself it was just the house settling, or maybe a rat. But a nagging feeling of unease settled in my gut. When I reached the bottom of the stairs, I shone my phone's flashlight around the basement. Everything looked as it should, albeit more sinister in the dim light. I made my way to the circuit breaker and flipped the switches, but nothing happened. Frustrated, I turned to head back upstairs when I heard the noise again. This time it was closer. I stopped dead in my tracks, the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. Is anyone there? I called out, my voice trembling. The silence that followed was deafening. I slowly backed up, keeping my flashlight trained on the shadows. Suddenly, I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I whipped my phone around and caught a glimpse of someone ducking behind a stack of old boxes. My heart pounded in my chest as fear took hold. Someone was in my house, hiding in my basement. I wanted to run, but my legs felt like they were made of lead. I took a deep breath and forced myself to move, edging toward the stairs. I needed to get out of there, to call the police. I kept my eyes on the spot where I had seen the movement, praying whoever it was wouldn't follow me. As I reached the stairs, I heard a low, menacing voice. Don't even think about it, I turned to see a figure emerging from the shadows, a knife glinting in the faint light. Panic surged through me. I bolted up the stairs, taking them two at a time, my heart racing. I slammed the basement door shut and locked it, my hands shaking uncontrollably. I leaned against the door, trying to catch my breath, my mind racing with fear and disbelief. I needed to call for help, but my phone was still my only source of light. I hurried to the living room and grabbed the landline phone, but the line was dead. The storm must have taken out the phone lines too. I was trapped in my own house with an intruder in the basement, 
and no way to call for help. I barricaded myself in the living room, pushing furniture against the door. I knew it wouldn't hold for long if the intruder decided to break it down, but it was the best I could do. I clutched my phone, my fingers trembling as I dialed 911, hoping against hope that I could get a signal. Miraculously, the call went through. I whispered my situation to the operator, giving them my address and describing the intruder. They assured me that officers were on their way, but in the storm, it might take some time for them to arrive. I huddled in the corner of the room, my eyes glued to the barricaded door. Minutes felt like hours as I waited, every creak and groan of the house amplified by my fear. I heard the basement door rattle, and then the unmistakable sound of it being kicked open. Footsteps echoed down the hallway, slow and deliberate. The intruder was searching for me. I held my breath, trying to remain silent, praying they wouldn't find me. The footsteps grew louder, closer, until they were just outside the living room door. The door handle jiggled, and the door shook as the intruder tried to force it open. The barricade held, but I knew it wouldn't last long. I heard a grunt of frustration, and then silence. The anticipation was unbearable. What was he doing? Was he trying to find another way in? Just when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, I heard the sound of sirens in the distance. Relief washed over me. The police were finally here. The intruder must have heard them too, because the footsteps retreated, moving quickly back towards the basement. A few moments later, there was a loud crash as the front door burst open, and police officers flooded the house, their flashlights cutting through the darkness. I ran to them, tears streaming down my face, and pointed towards the basement. He's down there, I cried. The officers moved swiftly, descending into the basement with their weapons drawn. I stayed upstairs, surrounded by the comforting presence of more officers, knowing I was finally safe. The minutes ticked by slowly, but eventually the officers emerged from the basement with the intruder in handcuffs. He glared at me with cold, menacing eyes as they led him away, but I didn't care. He was caught, and I was safe. The police later told me that the man was a known criminal, wanted for several break-ins in the area. He had likely taken advantage of the storm and the power outage to hide in my house, planning to rob it once he thought everyone was asleep. The experience left me shaken, but I was grateful for the quick response of the police and the fact that I had managed to stay safe. In the weeks that followed, I took extra precautions installing better locks getting a security system, and making sure I always had a way to call for help. That night changed me. I became more vigilant, more aware of the potential dangers around me. But I also learned that I could stay calm under pressure, that I could think clearly even when I was terrified. And most importantly, I learned the value of being prepared for the unexpected, because you never know what might be lurking in the shadows of your own home. Story 11 Moving to a new neighborhood always comes with its own set of challenges and surprises. For me, it was the quiet suburban area that seemed perfect friendly neighbors, well-kept lawns, and a sense of community. Among these neighbors was Mr. James, an older man living next door. He was the kind of neighbor who waved every morning, helped with small tasks, and even brought over cookies during the holidays. He seemed friendly, harmless, and well-liked by everyone in the community. Mr. James had a routine that was almost predictable. Every morning he would take a leisurely walk around the block, waving at everyone he passed. He tended to his garden meticulously, and often spent afternoons reading on his porch. Occasionally he'd chat with the neighbors, sharing stories about his younger days and offering gardening tips. He had an easygoing charm that made him popular, especially with the children who would often stop by for his famous homemade lemonade. I moved into the neighborhood during the spring, and Mr. James was one of the first people to welcome me. He helped me carry boxes into the house, and even offered to lend me some tools for the move-in process. 
We struck up a friendship, chatting about everything from the weather to local events. I never thought twice about his presence or questioned his background. He was just Mr. James, the nice old man next door. One evening, about six months after I moved in, I noticed something unusual. As I was taking out the trash, I saw a couple of police cars parked down the street. Officers were talking to neighbors, and there was a sense of unease in the air. Curious, I approached one of my neighbors, Mrs. Thompson, and asked what was going on. Apparently, there's a fugitive on the loose, she whispered, glancing around nervously. The police are checking the area. They think he might be hiding somewhere nearby. This was unsettling news. Our neighborhood was known for its safety and tranquility, not for fugitives hiding out. I thanked Mrs. Thompson and headed back inside, locking all the doors and windows. That night I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. Who could it be? Was someone in our neighborhood harboring a criminal? The next morning, things seemed to return to normal. The police presence was gone and neighbors were going about their routines. I saw Mr. James in his garden, as usual, and waved. He waved back, smiling warmly. For a moment, I felt reassured. Whatever had happened last night was surely just a misunderstanding or an overreaction. A few days later, I noticed something odd. Mr. James was out walking later than usual, and he seemed tense, constantly looking over his shoulder. He wasn't his usual cheerful self, and it struck me as strange. That evening, I was out on my porch when I saw a car slowly cruising down our street. It parked a few houses away, and a man got out, looking around suspiciously before heading towards Mr. James's house. Instinctively, I knew something was wrong. I watched as the man approached Mr. James, who had just come out to get his mail. Their exchange was brief, but intense. Mr. James looked pale, his hands trembling as he handed something over to the stranger. The man nodded and walked back to his car, driving off into the night. My mind raced with possibilities. Who was that man? What was he doing with Mr. James? I decided to keep an eye on things, not wanting to jump to conclusions but feeling increasingly uneasy about my neighbor. The following weekend, there was a neighborhood barbecue at the park. Everyone was there, including Mr. James, who seemed back to his old, cheerful self. I tried to act normal but my curiosity got the better of me. I struck up a conversation with him, steering the topic towards his past. He was evasive, offering vague answers about his previous life before moving here. My suspicion grew. That night I did something I never thought I'd do. I searched online for any news about fugitives in the area. I sifted through countless articles until I found one that made my blood run cold. The article was about a man wanted for a series of financial crimes and frauds, a man who had been on the run for years. The sketch in the article looked eerily like Mr. James. My heart pounded as I pieced it together. The police presence, the stranger's visit, Mr. James's odd behavior, it all made sense now. I debated what to do. Should I confront him? Call the police? I decided to err on the side of caution and called the non-emergency police line, explaining my suspicions. The next few days were tense. Undercover officers began to surveil Mr. James's house, blending in with the neighborhood activities. I continued to act normally, all while feeling the weight of the secret I carried. Finally, one evening, the police moved in. I watched from my window as they approached Mr. James's house. He answered the door, his face a mask of confusion and fear. The officers spoke to him calmly but firmly and then placed him in handcuffs. My heart ached as I saw him led away. He turned to look at me, a mixture of betrayal and resignation in his eyes. The neighborhood buzzed with shock and disbelief as news spread. Mr. James, the kind, harmless neighbor, was actually a wanted fugitive. It felt surreal, like a plot twist in a movie. 
As the police explained, he had been living under an assumed identity, hiding from the law for over a decade. In the aftermath, the neighborhood struggled to reconcile the friendly neighbor we knew what the criminal he actually was. It took time to adjust to feel safe and trusting again. As for me, I learned a valuable lesson about appearances and the hidden lives people lead. Mr. James had seemed like the perfect neighbor, but beneath that facade was a man running from his past. The experience left a mark on me, a reminder that even in the most idyllic settings, danger and deceit can lurk unseen. It taught me to be more vigilant, more questioning of the world around me. And while I missed the friendly wave and the garden tips, I couldn't forget the look in his eyes as he was taken away, a silent plea for understanding and forgiveness that I wasn't sure I could give. Story 12 Living with a roommate had always seemed like a practical solution to managing expenses and avoiding loneliness. When I moved to the city for a new job, I found Sarah through a mutual friend. She seemed perfect friendly, responsible, and with a solid job of her own. We hit it off immediately, and I felt lucky to have found someone so compatible. For the first few months, everything was great. We shared household chores, respected each other's space, and even became friends, spending evenings chatting about our days or watching movies together. It felt comfortable and safe, a good situation all around. But gradually I started noticing odd things. Sarah would sometimes make strangely accurate comments about private matters I hadn't discussed with her. At first I brushed it off, thinking maybe I had mentioned something in passing and forgotten. But it kept happening, and my unease grew. One evening, while I was working late at home, I received a call from my boss. We discussed sensitive company information, strategies for an upcoming project, and some personal thoughts I had about the team's dynamics. It was a confidential conversation, and I made sure to speak in a low voice, knowing Sarah was in her room. The next day, during breakfast, Sarah made a casual remark about the very project I had discussed with my boss. She mentioned a detail so specific that it couldn't have been a coincidence. I felt a chill run down my spine. How could she possibly know that? Determined to get to the bottom of it, I decided to investigate. That weekend, when Sarah went out to run errands, I started searching her room. It felt wrong an invasion of privacy, but I needed answers. I looked through her desk drawers, her nightstand, even under her bed. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Then I noticed her laptop. It was partially open, and a small, unobtrusive device was attached to one of the USB ports. I pulled it out and examined it closely. It was a miniature recording device. My heart raced as the realization dawned on me Sarah had been recording our conversations. I quickly connected the device to my own laptop and began listening to the files. There were hours upon hours of recordings, not just of our casual chats but of every conversation I had in the apartment. There were even recordings of my phone calls. My sense of betrayal was overwhelming. Why was she doing this? The next file I found was even more disturbing. It was an email addressed to an unknown recipient detailing the contents of some of the recordings along with a summary of the information. The subject line read new data for sale. My blood ran cold. Sarah was selling my private conversations to a third party. I printed out the email and saved the recordings as evidence. I needed to confront Sarah but I wanted to do it safely. I called a close friend, Josh, and explained the situation. He agreed to come over and be there when I talked to her. When Sarah returned, Josh and I were waiting in the living room. She looked surprised to see him, but smiled warmly. Hey, what's going on, she asked. I took a deep breath and held up the printout of the email. Sarah, I found this on your computer. You've been recording our conversations and selling the information. Her face turned pale, and she took a step back. I... I can explain, she stammered. 
Explain. You've been spying on me and profiting from it. How could you do this? I demanded, my voice shaking with anger and hurt. Sarah's expression shifted from shock to resignation. She sat down, avoiding her eyes. I was in debt, she admitted. A lot of debt. I didn't know how else to get out of it. Someone approached me, offering money for information. At first it was just general stuff, nothing too personal. But then it escalated. They wanted more detailed, more private information. I was desperate. I felt a mix of anger and pity. You should have asked for help. We could have figured something out together. But this, this is unforgivable. Josh stepped in, his voice firm. You need to leave, Sarah. Pack your things and go. We'll give you until the end of the day. If you're not gone by then, we'll call the police. Sarah nodded, tears in her eyes. I'm so sorry, she whispered, standing up and heading to her room to pack. The rest of the day was tense and silent. Josh stayed with me, offering support as I processed the betrayal. After Sarah left, I contacted the police and handed over the evidence. They launched an investigation, and I was assured that the people she sold the information to would be tracked down. It was a small comfort, but it didn't erase the sense of violation and betrayal I felt. In the weeks that followed, I changed all my passwords alerted my workplace about the breach, and took steps to secure my personal information. The apartment felt emptier, and the trust I once had in people was shattered. It took a long time for me to feel safe again. I found a new roommate eventually, but I was much more cautious this time, setting clear boundaries and ensuring there was a level of transparency between us. The experience with Sarah left a lasting mark a reminder of how easily trust can be broken and how important it is to protect one's privacy. Life slowly returned to normal, but I never forgot the lesson I learned even those who seem friendly and harmless can have hidden motives. It's a reality that made me more guarded but also more resilient. Trust once broken is hard to rebuild, but moving forward, I vowed to be more vigilant and to never let my guard down completely. Story 13 It was a late Friday afternoon, and I had decided to run some errands after work. The grocery store was busy, filled with people stocking up for the weekend. I navigated the aisles, picking up what I needed and enjoying the mundane normalcy of the task. With my cart full, I headed to the checkout, paid for my items, and made my way to the parking lot. As I loaded the bags into my car, I noticed a man lingering nearby. He was tall, with a scruffy beard and a worn baseball cap pulled low over his eyes. I didn't think much of it at first he could have been waiting for someone or just taking a break. But as I pulled out of the parking lot, I saw his car, an old, beat-up sedan, following me. My heart rate picked up a bit, but I tried to remain calm. Maybe it was just a coincidence. I made a few turns, heading towards my neighborhood, and each time, the sedan stayed behind me. I took a few unnecessary detours, hoping to shake him, but he matched every turn. Panic began to set in. This wasn't just my imagination, he was definitely following me. I considered calling the police, but I wasn't sure how to explain the situation. What if it was just a misunderstanding? I decided to head straight home, hoping that my familiar surroundings would give me some sense of security and maybe even deter him. As I pulled into my driveway, I saw the sedan stop a few houses down. I quickly grabbed my bags and hurried to my front door, glancing back to see the man getting out of his car. My hands trembled as I fumbled with my keys. The adrenaline made everything seem to move in slow motion. Finally, I managed to unlock the door and pushed it open, but before I could step inside, I felt a hand grab my shoulder. I spun around, dropping my groceries, and came face to face with the man. His eyes were cold, and his grip tightened painfully. Let me in, he demanded, his voice low and menacing. 
get away from me, I screamed, trying to pull free. My mind raced, searching for any possible way to escape. Let me in, or I'll make you regret it, he growled, pushing me against the doorframe. I managed to twist out of his grasp and kicked him as hard as I could in the shin. He yelled in pain, and I used the momentary distraction to dive into the house and slam the door shut. My hands were shaking so badly that it took me a few tries to lock the deadbolt. I could hear him pounding on the door, shouting threats. I grabbed my phone and called 911, my voice trembling as I told the operator what had happened. Someone followed me home and is trying to break in. Please hurry, I begged. The operator assured me that officers were on their way. I retreated further into the house, still hearing the man's furious banging on the door. I knew it wouldn't hold forever. I grabbed a kitchen knife and hid in the pantry, praying the police would arrive before he found another way in. The minutes felt like hours as I listened to the sounds of the man trying to force his way inside. Then, mercifully, I heard sirens. The pounding stopped, and I heard the man cursing before the sound of running footsteps faded away. I stayed hidden until I heard the authoritative knock of the police at my door. I peeked out the window to confirm it was them before unlocking the door, relief washing over me as I saw the officers. Are you alright? One of them asked, his face etched with concern. I nodded, tears streaming down my face as the adrenaline wore off. He tried to force his way and I managed to say. The officers quickly spread out, searching the area. They found the man hiding behind a neighbor's shed and arrested him. I watched from my window as they led him away in handcuffs. He glared at me with a look of pure hatred, but I felt safe knowing he was in custody. The police stayed with me for a while taking my statement and ensuring the house was secure. They told me the man was a known criminal with a history of assault and robbery. He had likely seen me at the grocery store and decided to follow me, hoping for an easy target. In the days that followed, I couldn't shake the fear that had settled over me. I installed additional locks in a security system, and I always made sure to be aware of my surroundings. Friends and family checked in on me regularly, offering support and comfort. Over time, the fear began to fade, replaced by a sense of resilience. The experience had shaken me deeply, but it also taught me the importance of being vigilant and trusting my instincts. I became more cautious, but I refused to let the incident define me or control my life. Looking back, I'm grateful for the quick response of the police and for my own presence of mind in a terrifying situation. It was a reminder that danger can strike unexpectedly, but with determination and support, I could overcome it and reclaim my sense of safety. Story 14 It was a gray, overcast Tuesday when the package arrived. I was sitting at my kitchen table, sipping my morning coffee and scrolling through emails when I heard the familiar sound of the mail carrier dropping off my daily delivery. A few bills, some junk mail, and a small, nondescript box with no return address sat on my doorstep. I brought the package inside, my curiosity peaked. It wasn't my birthday, and I wasn't expecting any deliveries. The box was plain, with no markings or indications of where it came from. My name and address were handwritten on the front in neat, precise lettering. I hesitated for a moment, feeling an odd sense of foreboding, but curiosity got the better of me. I grabbed a pair of scissors and carefully cut the tape sealing the box. Inside, nestled in a bed of crumpled newspaper, was a stack of photographs and a single sheet of paper. The first photo was of me, sitting in my living room, watching TV. I felt a chill run down my spine. The angle suggested it had been taken from outside my window. I flipped to the next photo it was me again, this time in my backyard tending to my garden. Each subsequent photo was more unsettling than the last me at the grocery store, walking to my car, sitting in my favorite cafe. Someone had been following me, documenting my every move. 
My hands trembled as I picked up the sheet of paper. It was a typed note, shortened to the point I'm watching you. Always. I dropped the note and the photos, backing away from the table as if they might come to life and attack me. My mind raced, trying to comprehend what was happening. Who could have done this? Why? My thoughts were interrupted by a sudden, overwhelming urge to check my surroundings. I closed all the blinds and locked the doors, my heart pounding in my chest. I called the police, my voice shaking as I explained the situation. They arrived quickly, taking the package and its contents as evidence. The officers were sympathetic, but there wasn't much they could do. Without any fingerprints or identifying marks, the photos and note provided few clues. The days that followed were a blur of anxiety and paranoia. I installed security cameras around my house and changed all the locks. Every creak, every shadow outside my window set my nerves on edge. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, of someone lurking just out of sight. One evening, about a week after the package arrived, I was reviewing the footage from my security cameras when I noticed something strange. A figure, cloaked in shadows, appeared at the edge of my yard. They didn't approach the house but stood there for several minutes watching. My blood ran cold as I realized this wasn't the first time I had seen that figure in the footage. They had been there before, always just on the periphery, always watching. I took the footage to the police, but again, there was little they could do. The figure was too obscured to identify, and without any further evidence, they couldn't take any action. I felt helpless, trapped in a nightmare with no way out. That weekend, I decided to stay with a friend, hoping a change of scenery might calm my nerves. As I packed a bag, I heard a knock at the door. My heart leapt into my throat. I wasn't expecting anyone. I approached the door cautiously, peering through the peephole. It was my neighbor, Mrs. Thompson, a sweet elderly woman who often stopped by for a chat. I opened the door, trying to hide my fear. Hello, Mrs. Thompson, I greeted her, forcing a smile. Hello, dear, she replied, her eyes crinkling with concern. I noticed you've been a bit on edge lately. Is everything all right? I hesitated, then decided to confide in her. I told her about the package, the photos, and the figure in my yard. She listened intently, her face growing more serious with each detail. That's terrible, she said when I finished. You know there's been a strange man around the neighborhood recently. I've seen him a few times, always late at night. I thought he might be homeless, but now I'm not so sure. Her words sent a fresh wave of fear through me. Have you seen him recently? I asked. She nodded. Just last night, actually. He was standing near your house, watching. I thanked Mrs. Thompson and closed the door, my mind racing. Whoever this person was, they were getting bolder. I decided it was time to take more drastic measures. I called the security company and arranged for a comprehensive system to be installed the next day. That night, I barely slept, jumping at every sound. Early the next morning, the security team arrived and set up the system, complete with motion sensors, alarms, and high-resolution cameras. I felt a small measure of relief, knowing my home was now a fortress. That evening, as I reviewed the new footage, I saw the figure again. This time, the cameras captured a clear image. It was a man, middle-aged, with a gaunt face and hollow eyes. He stood at the edge of my property, staring at my house with an intensity that made my skin crawl. I printed the image and took it to the police the next morning. With the clear image, the police were able to identify the man. He was a drifter with a history of stalking and harassment. They arrested him later that day, finding him with more photographs and detailed notes about my daily routines. The sense of relief was overwhelming. He was caught, and I was finally safe. In the days that followed, I worked to reclaim my sense of normalcy. 
The fear and anxiety began to fade, replaced by a renewed sense of vigilance. The experience left a lasting mark, a reminder of the fragility of privacy and the importance of staying aware of one's surroundings. I became more cautious, more protective of my personal space, but I also found strength in my resilience, in the way I had faced and overcome the terror that had invaded my life. The package, the photos, and the unsettling figure were now part of my past, a chapter one had survived and emerged from stronger and more determined to protect myself. And while the memory of that frightening time will never fully disappear, it serves as a testament to my courage and the power of taking control of my own safety. Story 15 Jogging at night had always been my way of unwinding after a long day. The cool, crisp air and the quiet streets provided the perfect backdrop for clearing my mind. My neighborhood was relatively safe, and I'd never had any reason to feel uneasy during my late night runs. That sense of security was shattered one night, changing my life forever. It was a typical Wednesday evening. I had finished dinner and watched some TV before lacing up my running shoes and heading out the door. The streets were deserted, as usual, and the only sounds were the rhythmic patter of my feet on the pavement and the occasional rustle of leaves in the breeze. I followed my usual route, a loop through the neighborhood that took about 30 minutes. About halfway through my run, I noticed a shadowy figure lingering at the end of the block. I couldn't make out any details in the dim street light, but something about the way they stood there, watching, made me uneasy. I told myself it was probably just another late night walker or someone waiting for a ride. I picked up my pace, wanting to get past them quickly. As I approached, the figure stepped into the light revealing a tall person wearing dark clothing and a black mask that obscured their face. My heart raced, and I instinctively crossed to the other side of the street, trying to put some distance between us. I glanced back over my shoulder and saw them following me, their pace matching mine. And panic set in, and I broke into a sprint, hoping to lose them. I zigzagged through side streets, taking random turns, but every time I looked back, the masked figure was still there, closing the distance. My lungs burned and my legs felt like lead, but I kept running, driven by pure fear. I finally reached my street, my house just a few yards away. Relief washed over me as I dashed up the driveway, fumbling with my keys. As I reached the door, a hand grabbed my shoulder, yanking me backward. I screamed, dropping my keys and spinning around to face my attacker. The masked assailant shoved me against the wall, their grip like iron. I know your routine and distorted voice hissed from behind the mask. I know where you live. Desperation gave me strength, and I kicked out, catching them in the knee. They staggered back, and I seized the opportunity to grab my keys and scramble inside, slamming the door shut and locking it. My hands shook as I dialed 911, my voice barely coherent as I explained the situation to the operator. Within minutes, the police arrived. They searched the area but found no trace of the masked attacker. I gave my statement, describing the events as best as I could through the haze of fear and adrenaline. The officers assured me they would increase patrols in the neighborhood and advised me to change my jogging routine. The next few days were a blur of anxiety and sleepless nights. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, the memory of that masked face haunting my every thought. I stopped jogging altogether, too afraid to venture out after dark. Friends and family offered their support, but nothing seemed to alleviate the constant sense of dread. A week later, I received a letter in the mail. There was no return address, just my name written in neat, precise lettering. My hands trembled as I opened it, revealing a single sheet of paper with a chilling message I'm still watching. I called the police again, showing them the letter. They took it as evidence, 
but there was little they could do without more information. The feeling of helplessness was overwhelming. I installed security cameras around my house and changed all the locks, hoping to regain some sense of safety. One evening, while reviewing the footage from the security cameras, I noticed something that made my blood run cold. The masked figure was back, lurking at the edge of my property, just out of the reach of the street lights. They stood there for several minutes before disappearing into the night. The police increased their patrols, but the figure remained elusive, always just a step ahead. I couldn't take the constant fear any longer. I decided to stay with my sister in another part of town, hoping the distance would keep me safe. While at my sister's, I began to piece together the events, trying to make sense of why I had been targeted. I realized that someone must have been watching me for a long time, learning my routines and waiting for the right moment to strike. It was a chilling thought, but it also gave me a sense of resolve. I refused to let this person control my life. With the police's help, I developed a plan to catch the stalker. I returned home, but this time I was prepared. I changed my jogging route daily, varying the times and paths I took. The police followed discreetly, ready to intervene if the attacker showed up again. It didn't take long. One night, as I was jogging down a different street, I saw the masked figure appear from behind a tree. My heart pounded, but I kept my pace steady, leading them towards a prearranged location where the police were waiting. As soon as the figure got close enough, the officers sprang into action, surrounding them and tackling them to the ground. The mask was pulled off, revealing a familiar face one of my co-workers, someone I had never suspected. The police found a disturbing collection of photos and notes in his possession detailing my routines and personal life. He had been fixated on me for months, planning the attack and the subsequent harassment. The relief was overwhelming. He was arrested and charged with stalking and attempted assault. The sense of safety I had lost began to return, slowly but surely. It took time, therapy, and the support of my loved ones, but I started to rebuild my life. The experience changed me. I became more vigilant, more aware of my surroundings, but I also learned about my own resilience and the importance of not letting fear dictate my actions. I returned to jogging, though I was always cautious, carrying pepper spray and varying my routes. The memory of that masked assailant still lingers, a reminder of the fragility of security and the darkness that can lurk behind familiar faces but it also serves as a testament to my strength and determination to reclaim my life, no matter the obstacles. Story 16 I'd been looking forward to my weekend getaway in the woods for months. The thought of escaping the hustle and bustle of the city, of spending a few days surrounded by nature, was a dream come true. I found a charming cabin online, nestled deep in the forest far from any distractions. It seemed perfect, picturesque, serene, and exactly what I needed to recharge. The drive to the cabin was peaceful. The further I got from the city, the more relaxed I felt. The narrow, winding road leading into the forest was lined with towering trees, their leaves rustling softly in the breeze. I arrived at the cabin in the late afternoon, the setting sun casting a golden glow over everything. The cabin was even more charming in person, a rustic wooden structure with a cozy porch and a small garden out front. I unpacked my bags, taking in the tranquil surroundings. The air was fresh and crisp, filled with the earthy scent of pine. Inside, the cabin was quaint and comfortable, with a stone fireplace, a plush armchair, and a well-stocked kitchen. I decided to explore the area a bit before settling in for the evening. As I wandered through the woods, I felt a sense of peace wash over me. The only sounds were the chirping of birds and the rustle of leaves underfoot. I followed a small trail that led to a crystal clear stream, its water sparkling in the fading light. 
After spending some time by the stream, I headed back to the cabin, feeling content and refreshed. That night, I built a fire in the fireplace and curled up with a book, the warmth of the flames creating a cozy ambiance. I drifted off to sleep easily, the quiet of the forest lulling me into a deep, restful slumber. The next morning, I decided to explore more of the woods. I packed a small bag with water and snacks and set out on a hike. As I ventured deeper into the forest, I stumbled upon a clearing. In the middle of the clearing was a large shed, weathered and old, with its door slightly ajar. Curious, I approached the shed, wondering what it was used for. I pushed the door open and peered inside. The dim light filtering through the cracks revealed stacks of boxes and barrels, all neatly arranged. At first I thought it might be a storage space for the cabin's owner. But as I looked closer I noticed something strange. The boxes were labeled with cryptic symbols and abbreviations and the barrels had warning labels indicating hazardous materials. A sense of unease crept over me. I carefully opened one of the boxes, revealing a stash of firearms and ammunition. Another box contained bags of a white powdery substance that looked suspiciously like drugs. My heart began to race as the realization hit me I had stumbled upon a stash of illegal goods. I quickly backed out of the shed, my mind racing. Who had put this here? Why was it so close to the cabin? Panic set in as I considered the possibilities. If whoever owned these goods found out I had discovered them, I could be in serious danger. I hurried back to the cabin, trying to stay calm. My first instinct was to call the police, but I realized that cell service was spotty in this remote area. I needed to leave, and fast. I packed my things as quickly as possible, my hands shaking with fear. Just as I was about to head out the door, I heard the sound of engines approaching. I peeked out the window and saw several rugged looking men on dirt bikes and ATVs pulling up to the cabin. My heart sank. They were here. I quickly hid in a small closet, hoping they wouldn't find me. I could hear them outside, talking and laughing their voices growing louder as they approached the cabin. The front door creaked open, and heavy footsteps echoed through the small space. Check the shed one of the men barked. Make sure everything's still there. I held my breath, praying they wouldn't find me. The footsteps receded, and I heard the door close again. They were heading to the shed. This was my chance. I slipped out of the closet, and crept towards the back door, moving as silently as possible. I could hear the men rummaging through the shed, their voices muffled but agitated. I opened the door just enough to slip through and sprinted into the woods, adrenaline coursing through my veins. I ran blindly, my only thought to get as far away from the cabin as possible. Branches whipped at my face, and my lungs burned with exertion, but I didn't stop. I could still hear the men in the distance, shouting angrily. They must have discovered that someone had been in the shed. After what felt like hours, I finally reached the road where I had parked my car. I jumped in and started the engine, peeling out onto the narrow road without looking back. My heart pounded in my chest as I sped away, the fear slowly giving way to relief as the cabin disappeared in my rearview mirror. Once I reached an area with cell service, I pulled over and called the police, explaining everything that had happened. They assured me they would investigate and advised me to stay away from the area. The rest of the drive home was a blur. My mind kept replaying the events, the fear and panic still fresh. When I finally reached my apartment, I collapsed onto the couch, exhausted and shaken. The peaceful getaway I had hoped for had turned into a nightmare. In the days that followed, the police contacted me with updates. They had raided the shed and found a significant cache of illegal goods. The men were part of a local gang using the cabin as a cover for their operations. Thanks to my call, several arrests were made and the operation was shut down. Despite the resolution, 
the experience left me deeply unsettled. I found it hard to trust again, constantly looking over my shoulder and double-checking locks. The tranquility of nature had been tainted by the sinister reality I had uncovered. Slowly, I began to regain my sense of security. I took self-defense classes, installed better security systems at home, and became more cautious about my surroundings. The memory of that weekend stayed with me, a stark reminder of how quickly things can go wrong, even in the most idyllic settings. While the fear has faded with time, the lesson remains. I learned to value my instincts, to be more aware and prepared. The woods, once a place of solace, now hold a different meaning a reminder of the dangers that can lurk behind the peaceful facade of nature. Story 17 Living in the city had always been an exciting adventure for me. The hustle and bustle, the vibrant nightlife, and the constant hum of activity made me feel alive. My apartment, a small but cozy place on the fifth floor, offered a perfect view of the street below. It was my sanctuary, a place where I could watch the world go by without getting caught up in its chaos. One evening, as I was preparing dinner, I heard a commotion outside. Curious, I went to the window and peered through the blinds. What I saw made my blood run cold. In the alley across the street, a man was violently assaulting another man. The victim was trying to defend himself, but the attacker was relentless, landing blow after blow. I stood frozen in shock, my heart pounding in my chest. Before I could react, the attacker looked up and locked eyes with me. His expression twisted with rage, and for a moment, time seemed to stand still. I quickly ducked out of sight, my mind racing. I grabbed my phone and called 911, my hands shaking as I described what I had seen. The operator assured me that officers were on their way, but I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had settled over me. Minutes later I heard sirens and saw the flashing lights of police cars. I peeked out the window again, seeing the officers apprehend the attacker. The victim was taken away in an ambulance, and the street slowly returned to its usual quiet state. I thought the worst was over, but I couldn't have been more wrong. The next morning I found a note slipped under my door. It read, I saw you. Mind your own business, my heart sank. The attacker knew where I lived. Fear settled in as I realized the implications. I had become a witness, and now I was a target. Over the next few days, the harassment began. It started with more notes, left on my door, and even taped to my car. Each one was more menacing than the last, warning me to stay quiet or face the consequences. I reported the threats to the police, but there was little they could do without catching the perpetrator in the act. They advised me to be cautious and offered to increase patrols in the area. I installed additional locks on my doors and windows and purchased a security camera to monitor the hallway outside my apartment. Despite these measures, the sense of security I once felt in my home was shattered. Every creak and shadow set my nerves on edge, and I found it difficult to sleep, constantly fearing another attack. One night, as I was lying in bed, I heard a noise outside my window. My apartment was on the fifth floor, so it was unlikely anyone could be out there. But the sound persisted, a faint scraping that sent chills down my spine. I crept to the window and peeked through the blinds, my heart pounding. There on the fire escape was the attacker, his face twisted in a sinister grin as he tried to pry the window open. I screamed and ran to the door, my first instinct to get out of the apartment. I grabbed my phone and called the police as I fled down the stairs, my mind racing with terror. I could hear the sound of breaking glass behind me, knowing he had managed to get inside. The dispatcher on the other end of the line tried to keep me calm, assuring me that officers were on their way. I burst out of the building and into the street, my breaths coming in ragged gasps. I didn't stop running until I reached a nearby convenience store, where I waited for the police. They arrived moments later, and I watched as they stormed my building, their flashlights cutting through the darkness. 
The attacker was gone by the time they reached my apartment, but the damage was done. My window was shattered, and the sense of safety I had tried so hard to maintain was completely destroyed. The police took my statement and promised to do everything they could to find him, but I knew I couldn't stay there any longer. I packed a bag and went to stay with a friend, too afraid to return to my apartment. Over the next few weeks I moved around, staying with different friends and family members, never staying in one place for too long. The police kept me updated on their progress, but the attacker remained elusive. Despite the fear and uncertainty, I refused to let him control my life. I began taking self-defense classes, determined to protect myself if it ever came to that. I also started seeing a therapist who helped me work through the trauma and regain some semblance of normalcy. Eventually, the police caught a break. The attacker was spotted in another part of the city and after a brief chase, he was arrested. The sense of relief was overwhelming but it was tempered by the knowledge that the ordeal had left a lasting impact on me. I decided to move to a new apartment, in a different part of the city. The process of finding a new place and settling in was daunting, but it felt like a fresh start. My new apartment was on a higher floor, with better security, and I made sure to get to know my neighbors. The fear slowly began to fade, replaced by a cautious optimism. I resumed my routines, finding comfort in the familiarity of everyday life. The experience had changed me, making me more vigilant and aware of my surroundings, but it had also shown me my own strength and resilience. Looking back, I realized that witnessing the crime and enduring the subsequent harassment had tested me in ways I never imagined. It was a stark reminder of the dangers that can lurk in the shadows, but it also taught me the importance of standing up for myself and seeking help when needed. The city, with all its chaos and unpredictability, still held its allure. I continued to find solace in its rhythm, its vibrant energy a testament to the resilience of those who call it home. And as I moved forward, I carried with me the lessons learned from that harrowing experience determined to face whatever challenges lay ahead with courage and confidence. Story 18 It was a rainy Saturday afternoon, and I was on my way home from running errands. The weather had taken a turn for the worse, with heavy rain reducing visibility and making the road slick. I drove carefully, my windshield wipers working over time to clear the torrent of water. As I approached an intersection, the traffic light turned yellow. I had plenty of time to stop, so I eased on the brakes. Unfortunately, the car behind me did not. There was a loud screech of tires and a sudden jolt as the vehicle slammed into my rear bumper. I was startled, but not hurt. I took a deep breath, checked my rearview mirror, and pulled over to the side of the road to assess the damage and exchange information with the other driver. The other car, an old sedan followed suit, pulling in behind me. I grabbed my insurance and registration documents from the glove compartment and stepped out into the rain. The driver of the sedan, a tall man with a rugged appearance, emerged from his vehicle, visibly agitated. His face was twisted in anger, and he stormed towards me. Look what you did to my car, he shouted, his voice barely audible over the rain. Do you even know how to drive? I was taken aback by his aggression. I'm sorry about the accident, but you hit me, I replied, trying to keep my voice calm and steady. Let's exchange information and get this sorted out. He wasn't interested in a rational discussion. This is your fault, he yelled, stepping closer. His eyes were wild and I could see the veins bulging in his neck. You're going to pay for this. I realized that this situation was escalating quickly. Please, let's just call the police and let them handle it, I suggested, trying to defuse the tension. The man's expression darkened even further. You're not calling anyone, he snarled, reaching out and snatching my phone from my hand. You're going to give me everything I want, or you'll regret it. Panic surged through me. 
This was no longer a minor accident, it was turning into something far more dangerous. I needed to get out of there. I took a step back, eyeing my car door. The man noticed and moved to block my path, his stance menacing. Give me your wallet and keys, he demanded, his voice low and threatening. Desperation took over. I had to act quickly. I glanced around, spotting a convenience store a block away. Without warning, I bolted towards it, splashing through the puddles as fast as I could. I heard him shout behind me, his footsteps pounding on the wet pavement in pursuit. I burst through the door of the store, gasping for breath. The clerk looked up, startled by my sudden entrance. Help, I shouted. I'm being followed. The clerk immediately understood the urgency and reached for the phone to call the police. The other driver burst into the store a moment later, his face contorted with rage. He stopped short when he saw the clerk on the phone, realizing that his threats were now exposed to witnesses. Get out of here, the clerk shouted, brandishing the phone like a weapon. The man hesitated, his eyes flicking between me and the clerk. Finally, he turned and fled the store, disappearing into the rain. My heart pounded as I watched him go, relief and fear mingling in my chest. The police arrived within minutes, and I recounted the entire incident to them. They took my statement and assured me they would search for the man. They also arranged for my car to be towed to a nearby repair shop, and one of the officers offered to drive me home. Over the next few days, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. Every time I heard a car pull up outside my house or footsteps approaching, my heart would race. The police had not yet found the man, and the uncertainty gnawed at me. I took extra precautions, changing my routine and staying with friends whenever possible. A week later, I received a call from the police. They had apprehended the man after he attempted to rob another driver in a similar manner. Relief washed over me, but the incident had left a lasting impact. I realized how vulnerable I had been, and it changed the way I viewed my safety on the road. I started taking self-defense classes and invested in a dash cam for my car. I also became more cautious about my surroundings, always ensuring I had an escape plan in mind. The experience had shaken me deeply, but it also made me more determined to protect myself and stay vigilant. In the end, the minor car accident was a harsh reminder of how quickly situations can escalate and how important it is to stay calm and think clearly under pressure. The man's aggressive behavior was unpredictable and dangerous, but I had managed to escape and seek help. The support of the police and the kindness of the convenience store clerk had been crucial, and I was grateful for their assistance. The memory of that rainy afternoon stayed with me, a reminder of the fragility of safety and the importance of being prepared. While I couldn't control the actions of others, I could take steps to ensure my own safety and well-being and that knowledge gave me a sense of empowerment and resilience, helping me move forward with confidence and caution. Story 19 Working late at the office had become a routine for me. As a project manager in a fast-paced tech company, deadlines were always looming, and the quiet of the late-night office was the perfect environment to get things done. My co-workers often joked that I should just move in, given how much time I spent there. One particularly hectic evening, I found myself alone on the 14th floor, the only light coming from my desk lamp and the faint glow of my computer screen. The hum of the air conditioning and the distant sounds of the city below were my only companions. I was deep into preparing a crucial presentation when I realized I needed some documents from the supply room. The supply room was at the end of the hallway, past rows of empty cubicles. As I approached, I noticed a light on inside. That was unusual, given that everyone else had left hours ago. I hesitated, wondering if I should check it out or just grab my documents and leave. Curiosity got the better of me. I opened the door slowly and peeked inside. To my surprise, I saw Mark, one of my co-workers, 
sitting at a table with papers spread out in front of him. Mark was a quiet guy, always keeping to himself. He worked in the eye department and rarely interacted with others outside of work-related tasks. Hey, Mark, I said, stepping into the room. Didn't expect to see anyone else here this late. He looked up, startled. For a moment, his eyes flickered with something that looked like fear, but he quickly masked it with a forced smile. Oh, hey, just catching up on some work, he replied, shuffling the papers together hastily. I nodded, grabbing the documents I needed from a nearby shelf. As I turned to leave, my eyes caught a glimpse of a blueprint among Mark's papers. It looked like a detailed layout of our office building. Something about the way certain areas were highlighted made me uneasy. Everything okay, I asked, trying to sound casual. Mark's smile faltered. Yeah, just some it stuff. You know how it is he was clearly trying to hide something. I left the supply room, but the image of those blueprints stayed with me. Back at my desk, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Mark's behavior had been off, and the blueprints seemed suspicious. My instincts told me to dig deeper. I waited until I was sure Mark had left for the night before heading back to the supply room. The papers were still there, haphazardly stacked. I carefully sifted through them, my heart pounding as I uncovered what Mark had been working on. The blueprints were indeed of our office building, but they weren't just standard layouts. They were marked with detailed notes about security systems, emergency exits, and high traffic areas. Another set of documents listed names and schedules of employees, along with unsettling notes about their routines and vulnerabilities. A chill ran down my spine as the pieces began to fit together. Mark was planning something terrible. I found a folder labeled Operation Clean Sweep, which contained a timeline and a list of materials, some of which were dangerous chemicals and weapons. The plan was detailed and meticulously organized, set to take place the following Monday during a company-wide meeting. I snapped photos of everything with my phone, my hands trembling. I knew I had to act fast. I couldn't confront Mark directly, he was clearly unstable and dangerous. Instead, I decided to go straight to our building security and the police. I hurried downstairs, my mind racing with fear and urgency. The security desk was manned by George, a no-nonsense ex-cop who had seen his fair share of trouble. I showed him the photos and explained what I had found. His expression grew grim. We need to call the police right away, George said, picking up the phone. And we need to make sure no one else is in danger tonight. The police arrived within minutes, taking my statement and reviewing the evidence. They immediately launched an investigation and placed the building on high alert. Over the weekend, they worked to ensure the safety of all employees and to prevent Mark from carrying out his plan. On Monday morning, instead of the usual hustle and bustle, there was a heavy police presence at the office. Employees were quietly informed of the situation and escorted to safety. Mark was arrested at his home, where the police found more evidence of his plans. It turned out he had been harboring a deep resentment towards the company and certain employees, which had driven him to plot this horrifying act of violence. In the aftermath, the company provided counseling and support for all employees. The knowledge that a co-worker had harbored such dark intentions shook us all. The office atmosphere changed, with increased security measures and a renewed focus on employee well-being. For me, the experience left a lasting impact. I had always believed in the importance of trusting one's instincts, but this reinforced it in a profound way. I continued to work late nights occasionally, but I was always more aware of my surroundings and the people around me. The most important lesson I learned was the value of vigilance and the courage to act when something doesn't feel right. It wasn't easy to confront the reality of what Mark had been planning, but by doing so I helped prevent a tragedy. 
That knowledge gave me a sense of resolve and a deeper understanding of the importance of community in looking out for one another. The office eventually returned to a semblance of normalcy, but the memory of that night remained a reminder of how quickly things can change and the importance of being prepared to act in the face of danger. Story 20 It was a brisk autumn morning when I found the USB drive. I was walking to work, the leaves crunching under my feet, when something glinted in the sunlight. Curious, I bent down and picked it up. It was a small, plain USB drive with no distinguishing marks. I slipped it into my pocket, intending to see what was on it later. The workday was busy, and I forgot about the drive until I got home that evening. I settled down at my desk, plugged the drive into my laptop, and opened the folder. What I found was unexpected and unsettling. The drive contained a series of documents, spreadsheets and photos, all pointing to illegal activities, money laundering, human trafficking and detailed plans for future crimes. My heart raced as I scrolled through the files, realizing the magnitude of what I had stumbled upon. I knew I had to report this to the authorities, but as I reached for my phone it rang. The caller ID showed an unknown number. Hesitantly, I answered. A cold, menacing voice spoke on the other end. We know you have the USB drive. Don't even think about going to the police. Stay silent, or you and your loved ones will pay the price. The line went dead. I sat there paralyzed with fear. They knew. Whoever these people were, they knew I had their drive and they were watching me. I felt a surge of panic and disconnected my laptop from the internet, worried that it might be compromised. I spent a sleepless night tossing and turning, my mind racing with the threats and the damning evidence on the drive. By morning I knew I had to act, but I needed to be smart about it. I decided to reach out to a friend of mine, Alex, who worked in cybersecurity. If anyone could help me navigate this, it was him. I met Alex at a quiet cafe, explaining the situation in hushed tones. His expression grew serious as he listened. You did the right thing by coming to me, he said. We need to be very careful. These people are dangerous. Alex took the USB drive and promised to analyze it securely, without connecting to any networks that could be traced. In the meantime, he advised me to lay low and act normal, not giving any indication that I was taking action. The next few days were a blur of anxiety. I went to work, trying to maintain a facade of normalcy, while constantly looking over my shoulder. Every unknown number that called, every unfamiliar face in the crowd, sent a jolt of fear through me. The threats continued, texts and voicemails warning me to stay silent. Alex contacted me a few days later with his findings. The drive is definitely connected to a criminal syndicate, he said. I've managed to trace some of their communications. These guys are serious, and they have eyes everywhere. What do we do, I asked, feeling a mix of fear and determination. We need to get this to the authorities, but in a way that protects you, Alex replied. I have a contact in the FBI. We'll arrange a secure handoff and make sure you're safe. The plan was set in motion. Alex coordinated with his FBI contact, Agent Johnson, who agreed to meet us in a secure location. The night of the meeting, Alex and I drove to an underground parking garage, our nerves on edge. We parked and waited, every sound amplified by our tension. Agent Johnson arrived, a tall, imposing figure who exuded authority. He listened as Alex explained the situation and handed over the drive. You've done the right thing, Johnson assured me. We'll take it from here, but you need to be cautious. These people don't take kindly to interference. As we left the garage, I felt a mix of relief and apprehension. The drive was in the right hands, but the danger wasn't over. The threats intensified over the next week, but now with the FBI involved, I had protection. They advised me to change my routines, stay with friends, and avoid any predictable patterns. One evening I received a call from Agent Johnson. 
We've made several arrests based on the information you provided, he said. The organization is in disarray, but we're still tracking down some of their key members. You need to stay vigilant. The news was a relief, but the reality of the situation still hung over me. I followed the FBI's advice, constantly aware of my surroundings. Slowly, the threats diminished as more members of the syndicate were apprehended. It took time, but the fear that had gripped my life began to loosen its hold. Eventually, things returned to a semblance of normalcy. The FBI assured me that the immediate threat had passed, though they continued to monitor the situation. I took additional precautions, such as installing security cameras and always being aware of my environment. The experience left a lasting impact on me. The discovery of that USB drive had thrust me into a world of danger and fear, but it had also shown me the importance of courage and doing what's right, even in the face of threats. I learned to appreciate the support of friends like Alex and the protection provided by law enforcement. Looking back, I realized that my actions had contributed to dismantling a dangerous criminal organization. It was a reminder of how ordinary people can make a difference and the importance of standing up against wrongdoing. And while the memory of those harrowing weeks remains with me, it also serves as a testament to resilience and the power of doing what's right, no matter the cost. Story 21 Backpacking through Europe had always been a dream of mine. The freedom to explore new places, meet new people, and immerse myself in different cultures was exhilarating. I meticulously planned my trip, booking hostels in various cities, packing only the essentials, and setting off with a sense of adventure. One of the most memorable, yet terrifying, stops was in a small town in Eastern Europe. The town was picturesque, with cobblestone streets, charming cafes, and historic architecture. The hostel I booked was a quaint building nestled between two larger structures. It looked inviting and cozy, a perfect place to rest and recharge. I arrived at the hostel in the early evening, tired but excited. The receptionist, a middle-aged woman with a kind smile, checked me in and handed me a key to my room. The room was basic but clean, with a bunk bed, a small desk, and a window overlooking the bustling street below. I unpacked my backpack, securing my valuables in a small locker provided by the hostel. After settling in, I decided to explore the town. I wandered through the streets, enjoying the local cuisine and taking in the sights. As the night grew darker, I headed back to the hostel, ready to get some rest for the next day's adventures. As I entered the hostel, I noticed a man loitering near the entrance. He was tall and muscular, with a shaved head and a menacing demeanor. Our eyes met briefly, and I felt a shiver run down my spine. I quickly dismissed the feeling, attributing it to my tiredness and the unfamiliar surroundings. I headed up to my room, locking the door behind me. I changed into my pajamas and climbed into bed, exhausted. Just as I was drifting off to sleep, I heard a faint knock at the door. Groggy and confused, I got up and approached the door cautiously. Who is it I called out, my voice shaky. It's the receptionist, a man's voice replied. There's an issue with your booking. I need to speak with you. Something felt off, but in my half-asleep state, I ignored my instincts and opened the door slightly. Before I could react, the door was pushed open violently, and the man from earlier barged in. He slammed the door shut and locked it, blocking my escape. Give me your money and valuables, he demanded, his voice cold and menacing. Do it now or things will get ugly. My heart pounded in my chest as fear took hold. I tried to stay calm, thinking of a way out. Okay, just take whatever you want, I stammered, backing away slowly. He approached me, his eyes filled with malice. No tricks. Empty your bag in your locker. Now. I quickly complied, dumping the contents of my backpack onto the bed. 
I retrieved my wallet, phone, and a few other valuables from the locker and handed them over. He snatched them from me, a cruel smile spreading across his face. Good, he said, pocketing the items. Now sit down and stay quiet. I sat on the edge of the bed, my mind racing. He stood by the door, watching me closely. Minutes felt like hours as I tried to think of a way to escape. The window was my only option, but we were on the second floor, and the drop was too high to jump without risking injury. Suddenly I remembered the emergency whistle I had attached to my keychain. It was a small silver whistle designed to alert people in case of danger. Slowly, I reached into my pocket, my fingers closing around the whistle. What are you doing, he barked, taking a step towards me. In one swift motion, I brought the whistle to my lips and blew as hard as I could. The shrill sound pierced the silence, echoing through the building. The man lunged at me, but it was too late. The noise had already drawn the attention of other hostile guests. Within moments, I heard hurried footsteps and frantic voices outside the door. The man panicked, glancing around for an escape route. Realizing he was trapped, he grabbed me by the arm, yanking me towards the door. Shut up and don't move, he hissed, pressing a knife to my throat. The door burst open, and several hostile guests, along with the receptionist, rushed in. They froze at the sight of the knife, unsure of what to do. The man tightened his grip on me, his eyes darting between the onlookers. Get back, he shouted. I'll hurt her if you don't move. The standoff felt like an eternity, but the receptionist stepped forward, her voice calm and steady. Let her go. She said, you don't need to do this, just take what you have and leave. The man hesitated, his grip on the knife loosening slightly. I took the opportunity to stomp on his foot as hard as hard as I could. He yelped in pain, his hold on me loosening. I twisted out of his grasp and ran towards the door. The hostile guest surged forward, tackling the man to the ground and disarming him. The police arrived shortly after, and the man was taken into custody. I gave my statement, still shaken but grateful to be safe. The hostel staff and guests were incredibly supportive, staying with me until I felt secure enough to be alone. The experience left me rattled, a stark reminder of the dangers that can lurk even in seemingly safe places. But it also showed me the strength of community and the importance of trusting my instincts. The kindness and bravery of the people who came to my aid reaffirmed my faith in humanity. I continued my journey through Europe, albeit with more caution and awareness. The memory of that night stayed with me, a reminder to always stay vigilant and to never underestimate the importance of personal safety. It was a harrowing experience, but it taught me invaluable lessons about resilience and the power of collective action in the face of danger. Story 22 It was a quiet night, and I was on my way back home after a long day at work. The clock on my dashboard read 11.45 p.m., and I decided to stop at a gas station to fill up my tank. The station was nearly empty, with only a few cars parked near the convenience store. I pulled up to a pump, got out of my car, and began filling the tank. The night was eerily silent the only sounds being the hum of the gas pump and the distant chirping of crickets. As I waited, I noticed a man approaching. He was tall and muscular, wearing a dark hoodie pulled low over his face. My instincts screamed at me that something was wrong, but before I could react, he was upon me. Don't make a sound, he growled, pressing a cold metal object against my side. I glanced down and saw the glint of a gun, get in the car and drive. Fear surged through me, my mind racing with the possible outcomes. I had no choice but to comply. I slowly removed the nozzle from the gas tank, replaced it, and got back into the driver's seat. The man slid into the passenger seat, his gun never leaving my side. 
Where are we going, I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. Just drive, he snapped. I'll tell you where to go. I started the car and pulled out of the gas station, my hands trembling on the steering wheel. The streets were dark and deserted, and the air was thick with tension. I glanced at the man out of the corner of my eye, trying to gauge his intentions, but his face was obscured by the hood. Turn left here, he instructed, and I obeyed, my heart pounding in my chest. As we drove through the empty streets, he directed me through a series of turns, taking us farther and farther from the city. The buildings thinned out, replaced by open fields and dense forests. I had no idea where we were going, and the fear of the unknown gnawed at me. Why are you doing this, I asked, hoping to appeal to whatever humanity he might have left. Well, just shut up and drive, he barked, his grip tightening on the gun. After what felt like hours, we arrived at an old, abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. The building was dark and foreboding, its windows shattered and walls covered in graffiti. The man ordered me to pull up to the entrance and stop the car. Get out, he commanded, and I did as he said, my legs shaking as I stepped out of the car. He motioned for me to follow him into the warehouse, keeping the gun trained on me. The interior was even more unsettling, with broken furniture and discarded debris littering the floor. He led me to a small room in the back, where a single flickering light bulb cast eerie shadows on the walls. Sit down, he ordered, pointing to a chair in the center of the room. I sat, my mind racing with thoughts of escape. What do you want from me, I asked, my voice trembling. He didn't answer right away. Instead, he paced back and forth, his eyes darting around the room as if searching for something. Finally, he spoke. I need money, he said, his voice low and desperate. A lot of money, and you're going to help me get it. I don't have much, I replied, my mind searching for a way out of this nightmare, but I can give you whatever I have. He shook his head. It's not enough. I need more than just your wallet. He pulled out a phone and handed it to me. Call your family. Tell them you've been kidnapped and that they need to pay a ransom to get you back. If you try anything funny, I'll kill you. My heart sank. This wasn't just a carjacking, it was a full-blown kidnapping. I took the phone with trembling hands and dialed my sister's number. She answered on the second ring. Hey, what's up, she said cheerfully. I took a deep breath, trying to keep my voice calm. Listen, I need you to do something for me. I've been kidnapped, and the man who took me wants money. You need to get as much as you can, and bring it to the old warehouse on the edge of town. Her voice turned to panic. What? Are you serious? Are you okay? I'm fine, I lied, glancing at the man who was watching me intently. Just do what I said, and don't call the police. Please. I hung up, my hands shaking. The man took the phone back and shoved it into his pocket. Good. Now we wait. The minutes ticked by slowly, each one feeling like an eternity. The man paced the room, his agitation growing with each passing second. I could only hope that my sister would follow my instructions and get the money without involving the authorities. Finally, after what felt like hours, the sound of a car engine approached the warehouse. The man tensed, his grip on the gun tightening. He motioned for me to stand and follow him to the entrance. Remember, no funny business, he warned, pressing the gun against my back. We stepped outside and I saw my sister's car parked a few yards away. She stood beside it, clutching a bag in her hands, her face pale with fear. The man ordered me to walk towards her, keeping the gun trained on me the entire time. Give me the money, he demanded as we approached. My sister handed over the bag, her eyes wide with terror. Please, just let her go, she pleaded. 
The man took the bag and quickly rifled through it, his expression darkening when he saw the amount. This isn't enough, he snarled. I need more. That's all we have. I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Please, just let us go. He hesitated, his eyes darting between us and the bag of money. Finally, he seemed to come to a decision. Fine, he spat. But if you ever try to find me or call the police, I'll come after you. With that, he turned and fled into the darkness, leaving us standing there, shaken and terrified. My sister rushed to me, pulling me into a tight hug. Are you okay, she asked, her voice trembling. I think so, I replied, my legs feeling weak. Let's just get out of here. We quickly got into her car and drove away from the warehouse, the adrenaline slowly wearing off. By the time we reached home, the reality of what had happened began to sink in. The police arrived shortly after we called them, taking our statements and assuring us they would do everything in their power to catch the man. They praised us for our bravery and quick thinking, but the fear lingered. In the days that followed, I struggled to return to a sense of normalcy. The memory of that night haunted me, and I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, afraid that the man might return. With time, the fear began to fade, replaced by a sense of gratitude for my safety and the support of my family. The experience had been terrifying, but it had also shown me the strength and resilience I didn't know I had. I continued to take precautions, always aware of my surroundings and more cautious than before. The memory of that night serves as a reminder of how quickly life can change and the importance of staying vigilant. Story 23 House sitting for my friend Sarah seemed like a great way to spend a quiet week a week away from my bustling city apartment. Her house was a charming, old Victorian home in a small, picturesque town. She and her husband were going on a week-long vacation and needed someone to look after their cat, Willow, and water the plants. I happily agreed, looking forward to the peace and quiet. The first few days were uneventful. I spent my mornings sipping coffee on the porch, reading novels in the cozy living room, and taking leisurely walks around the quaint neighborhood. Willow kept me company, curling up next to me as I lounged on the couch, it was a perfect getaway. On the fourth night, however, things took a strange turn. I was in the kitchen preparing dinner when I heard a soft thumping noise from above. I paused, listening carefully, but the sound stopped. Shrugging it off as the house settling, I continued cooking. But later that night, as I lay in bed, the noise returned. It was a faint but distinct sound, like footsteps moving across the attic floor. Curiosity got the better of me. I grabbed a flashlight and cautiously made my way to the attic. The house was dark and quiet, the only sound being the creak of the wooden stairs under my feet. At the top of the stairs, I reached for the attic door, hesitating for a moment before pushing it open. The attic was cold and dusty, filled with old furniture, boxes of forgotten belongings, and cobwebs hanging from the rafters. I swept the flashlight beam across the room, my heart pounding in my chest. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, but the feeling of being watched was overwhelming. I was about to leave when I noticed a small pile of blankets and a pillow tucked away in a corner, partially hidden behind a stack of boxes. My breath caught in my throat. Someone had been living up here. The blankets were neatly arranged and there were a few empty food containers nearby. Suddenly, I heard a noise behind me. I spun around, the flashlight beam catching a glimpse of movement. A man emerged from the shadows, his clothes tattered and dirty, his eyes wide with fear. He raised his hands in a gesture of surrender. Please don't call the police, he pleaded, his voice trembling. I'm not here to hurt anyone. I just needed a place to stay. I backed away, my mind racing. Who are you? I demanded, trying to keep my voice steady. 
My name is Tom, he said, lowering his hands. I've been living up here for a few weeks. I lost my job and my home. I had nowhere else to go. I didn't know what to do. Part of me felt sympathy for his situation, but another part was terrified. I took a deep breath, trying to think clearly. You need to leave, I said firmly. You can't stay here. This is my friend's house. Tom nodded, his shoulders slumping in defeat. I understand. I'll go. Just please, don't call the police. I watched as he gathered his few belongings, stuffing them into a worn-out backpack. I felt a pang of guilt as I saw the desperation in his eyes. Is there somewhere you can go? I asked, my voice softening. He shook his head. I'll figure something out. I escorted him down the attic stairs and out of the house, locking the door behind him. As he disappeared into the night, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had just turned away someone in dire need. The next morning I called Sarah and told her everything. She was shocked and concerned but grateful that I had discovered the intruder. She assured me that she would take care of things when she returned and advised me to keep the house locked up tight until then. For the rest of the week, I couldn't shake the unease that had settled over me. Every creak and groan of the old house set my nerves on edge, and I found myself constantly checking the locks and windows. Willow seemed to sense my anxiety, staying close by and occasionally hissing at unseen shadows. Sarah and her husband returned a few days later, and I was relieved to hand over the responsibility of the house. They called a locksmith to change all the locks and installed a security system to prevent any future intrusions. They also contacted the police, who took a report but admitted there was little they could do without more information on Tom's whereabouts. Despite the precautions, the incident left a lasting impact on all of us. Sarah and her husband were more vigilant, and I found myself more cautious in my own home. The experience served as a stark reminder of how quickly one's sense of security can be shattered. In the weeks that followed, I often thought about Tom. I wondered if he had found a safe place to stay or if he was still wandering the streets, searching for shelter. The memory of his fearful eyes haunted me, a reminder of the fragile line between safety and desperation. The experience taught me valuable lessons about empathy and vigilance. While it's important to protect oneself and one's home, it's equally important to remember the humanity of those who may be struggling. The world is full of unseen hardships, and sometimes the right response is a balance of caution and compassion. As time passed, I resumed my normal routine, but the memory of that night in the attic remained with me. It was a reminder that even in the most unexpected places, we can encounter those in need and be challenged to respond with both courage and kindness. Story 24 the decision to move cross-country was both exhilarating and daunting. I had accepted a new job in California, and the prospect of starting fresh in a different state was thrilling. I packed up my life into my old, reliable SUV and set off on the long journey from New York, eager to see the country along the way. The first few days of the drive were uneventful. I passed through picturesque towns and breathtaking landscapes, stopping at roadside diners and motels. It was the freedom I had been craving, a break from the routine of my previous life. On the fourth day, somewhere in the vast stretches of the Midwest, I encountered a hitchhiker. It was late afternoon, and the sun was beginning to dip below the horizon. I spotted him standing by the side of the road, thumb out, looking tired and disheveled. He was a tall man with scruffy hair and clothes that had seen better days. Against my better judgment, I felt a pang of sympathy. The road had been lonely, and I thought a bit of company might be nice. I pulled over and rolled down the window. Where are you headed, I asked. California, he replied, a hopeful look in his eyes. Same as me, I said, unlocking the passenger door. Hop in. 
He thanked me profusely as he climbed in, introducing himself as Jake. We chatted as I drove, and he seemed friendly enough, sharing stories about his travels and the places he'd seen. But as the hours passed, I began to notice something off about him. His stories were inconsistent, and he avoided questions about his background. As night fell, we stopped at a diner for a quick meal. Jake excused himself to use the restroom, and I took the opportunity to check my phone. A news alert caught my eye there had been a prison break a few days ago, and several inmates were still at large. My heart skipped a beat as I looked at the photos of the escapees. One of them bore a striking resemblance to Jake. My mind raced with fear and doubt. I couldn't be sure, but the resemblance was uncanny. I decided to keep my suspicions to myself and stay vigilant. We got back on the road, and I tried to keep the conversation light, my nerves on edge. It wasn't long before Jake's demeanor began to change. He grew quiet and tense, and I could feel the atmosphere in the car shift. I drove on, my hands gripping the steering wheel tightly, praying we would reach a populated area soon. As we neared a rest stop, Jake suddenly reached into his backpack and pulled out a knife, pressing it against my side. Keep driving, he ordered, his voice cold and menacing. Panic surged through me, but I forced myself to stay calm. What do you want, I asked, my voice trembling. Just keep driving and do as I say, he snapped. If you try anything, I won't hesitate to use this. My mind raced with possible escape plans, but the knife pressed against my side kept me compliant. I drove on, the road stretching endlessly ahead of us. The rest stop loomed in the distance, but Jake ordered me to bypass it. We drove in silence, the tension in the car palpable. After what felt like an eternity, he directed me to take a deserted exit and pull into a secluded area off the main road. My heart pounded in my chest as I complied, the dark, desolate surroundings amplifying my fear. Get out, he commanded, motioning with the knife. I obeyed, my mind desperately searching for a way out of this nightmare. He got out too, keeping the knife trained on me. Hand over your keys and wallet, he demanded. I handed them over, my hands shaking. He pocketed them and then gestured for me to move away from the car. Start walking, he said, a sinister smile spreading across his face. And don't look back. If you do, I'll make sure you regret it. With no other options, I turned and began walking down the dark road, my pulse racing. I heard the car door slam and the engine roar to life. Jake sped off, leaving me stranded in the middle of nowhere. As soon as the taillights disappeared, I broke into a run, heading back towards the main road. My heart pounded, but I refused to give in to the fear. I had to find help. After what felt like hours, I reached the rest stop I had seen earlier. I ran inside the brightly lit building, breathless and desperate. The clerk at the counter looked up, alarmed by my disheveled appearance. Please call the police, I gasped. I was carjacked. He's armed and dangerous. The clerk immediately called 911, and within minutes, a police car arrived. I recounted the entire ordeal to the officers, describing Jake and the direction he had driven off in. They assured me they would do everything in their power to apprehend him and recover my car. I was taken to the nearest police station, where I was given a chance to clean up and rest. The officers were kind and supportive, helping me contact my family and arrange transportation. The next morning, they informed me that they had found my car abandoned a few miles away. Jake had vanished, but they were continuing the search. The experience left me shaken and wary. My cross-country adventure had turned into a nightmare, and I found it difficult to trust anyone on the road. I eventually reached my destination in California, but the sense of freedom and excitement had been replaced by caution and vigilance. In the weeks that followed, 
I took self-defense classes and made sure to always be aware of my surroundings. The memory of that night stayed with me, a reminder of how quickly things can go wrong and the importance of trusting my instincts. While the experience was harrowing, it also taught me valuable lessons about resilience and the strength I didn't know I had. I became more cautious but also more determined to protect myself and stay safe. Jake was never caught, but I moved forward with my life, carrying the memory of that terrifying night as a reminder of the unpredictable nature of the world and the importance of being prepared for anything. Story 25 It was a beautiful Saturday morning, and I decided to go for a walk around my neighborhood. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, and the air was crisp and fresh. It felt like the perfect day to clear my head and enjoy some time outdoors. I put on my sneakers, grabbed my water bottle, and set off down the tree-lined streets. I had been walking for about 20 minutes, enjoying the peaceful atmosphere, when I noticed a car slowly approaching me from behind. At first I didn't think much of it. Cars pass by all the time and I assumed it was just someone looking for an address or taking a leisurely drive. But as the car got closer, I felt a prickle of unease. It was moving too slowly, almost as if it were following me. I glanced over my shoulder and saw a dark sedan with tinted windows. The car pulled up beside me and the driver's window rolled down. A man in his forties, with unkempt hair and a scruffy beard, leaned out. Hey, can you help me with directions, he asked, his voice friendly but with an undertone that set off alarm bells in my head. I forced a polite smile, stepping back slightly. Sure, where are you trying to go? He gave me an address I didn't recognize, and as I tried to think of a response, he suddenly opened the car door and lunged at me. Panic surged through me, and I instinctively jumped back, my heart racing. What are you doing? I shouted, backing away quickly. Get in the car, he growled, his demeanor shifting from feigned friendliness to aggressive determination. Now. Adrenaline kicked in, and I turned and ran. I sprinted down the sidewalk, my mind a blur of fear and desperation. I heard the car door slam behind me and the engine rev as he started to chase me. My only thought was to get away, to find help. I rounded a corner and saw a woman walking her dog. Help. Please help me, I screamed, waving my arms frantically. She looked up, alarmed, and quickly assessed the situation. Without hesitation, she ran towards me, putting herself between me and the approaching car. The man in the car slowed down, realizing that he now had a witness. He glared at us for a moment before speeding off, tires screeching as he turned the corner. My legs felt like jelly, and I collapsed onto the sidewalk, gasping for breath. The woman knelt beside me, her dog barking anxiously. Are you okay, she asked, her voice filled with concern. I think so, I panted, still shaken. He tried to grab me. Thank you for helping. We need to call the police, she said firmly, pulling out her phone. She dialed 911 and quickly explained what had happened. Within minutes, a patrol car arrived and the officers took our statements. I described the man in the car as best as I could, though the details were fuzzy in my panic. The officers assured me they would patrol the area and look for the vehicle. They also advised me to be cautious and to avoid walking alone for a while. The woman, whose name was Emily, stayed with me until the police finished taking our statements. She offered to walk me home, and I gratefully accepted. As we walked, she told me about similar incidents that had happened in nearby neighborhoods recently. It seemed that this man had been targeting women out for walks, trying to abduct them. By the time we reached my house, I was still shaken but incredibly grateful for Emily's intervention. We exchanged phone numbers, and she promised to check in on me later. I thanked her profusely and went inside, locking the door behind me. The rest of the day passed in a haze. 
I couldn't shake the feeling of vulnerability and fear that had settled over me. I kept replaying the incident in my mind, thinking of all the ways it could have ended differently if Emily hadn't been there. That evening, I received a call from the police. They had found the car abandoned a few miles away, but the driver was nowhere to be seen. They promised to keep me updated on their investigation and advised me to be vigilant. In the days that followed, I found it difficult to leave the house. The once peaceful streets of my neighborhood now felt threatening, and every passing car sent a jolt of fear through me. I decided to take self-defense classes, hoping to regain some sense of control and confidence. Emily and I kept in touch, and she introduced me to a local neighborhood watch group. The community rallied together, organizing regular patrols and sharing information about suspicious activity. It was comforting to know that we were looking out for each other. Over time, the fear began to fade, replaced by a newfound sense of empowerment. I learned how to stay aware of my surroundings and to trust my instincts. The experience had been terrifying, but it also taught me the importance of community and the strength that comes from standing together. Months later, the police caught the man responsible for the attempted abductions. He was charged and sentenced, bringing a sense of closure to the ordeal. Knowing that he was behind bars helped me to finally feel safe again. Looking back, I realized how lucky I had been. Emily's quick thinking and willingness to help a stranger had made all the difference. The experience had changed me, but it also strengthened my resolve to never let fear dictate my actions. I continued to walk in my neighborhood, always cautious but no longer afraid, determined to reclaim the peace and joy I had once found in those quiet, tree-lined streets. Story 26 Online dating had always seemed like a convenient way to meet new people, especially given my busy schedule. After years of focusing on my career, I decided to give it a try, hoping to find someone special. I created a profile on a popular dating app, uploaded a few photos, and started swiping. It wasn't long before I matched with a guy named Daniel. He was charming and seemed genuinely interested in getting to know me. We exchanged messages for a few weeks, and our conversations were easy and engaging. He asked about my hobbies, my favorite places to visit, and even little details about my daily routine. At the time, his attentiveness felt flattering. After a few weeks of messaging, we decided to meet in person. We chose a cozy cafe downtown, a place I often visited. When I arrived, Daniel was already there, waiting with a warm smile. The date went well, and we agreed to meet again. Over the next few weeks, we went on several dates, each one better than the last. It seemed like things were going great. However, small details started to nag at me. Daniel often mentioned things about me that I hadn't shared with him. He knew my favorite cafe before I told him, referenced places I visited frequently, and even brought up a specific brand of perfume I wore. Initially, I chalked it up to coincidence or a good memory, but the unease grew. One evening, while having dinner at a new restaurant I hadn't mentioned to anyone, Daniel showed up unexpectedly. What a coincidence, he exclaimed, acting surprised to see me. But the look in his eyes was anything but surprised. It was then that I started to suspect something was seriously wrong. My curiosity and concern got the better of me, and I decided to dig a little deeper. I started by checking his social media profiles more closely, looking for any clues about his behavior. That's when I discovered something chilling. Daniel had been commenting on photos of places I'd been to, even before we met. He had liked posts from friends of mine whom I hadn't introduced him to, and he seemed to know an unsettling amount about my life. Feeling uneasy, I decided to test him. During our next conversation, I casually mentioned that I would be visiting a park on the outskirts of town the following weekend. In reality, I had no intention of going there. I wanted to see if he would show up. Sure enough, 
on the day I mentioned I received a text from Daniel. Hey, I'm at the park you told me about. Thought I'd surprise you, my heart sank. It was clear now Daniel had been stalking me, using the information he gathered from our conversations and possibly other sources to keep tabs on me. Fear gripped me as I realized the extent of his intrusion into my life. I decided it was time to take action. I blocked him on all social media platforms and the dating app, but I knew that wasn't enough. I needed to report his behavior to the authorities and protect myself from any further invasion of my privacy. I went to the local police station and filed a report, explaining everything that had happened. The officer I spoke with took my concern seriously and assured me they would investigate. They advised me to change my routine, avoid places I frequented, and consider staying with friends or family for a while. Feeling a mix of relief and anxiety, I followed their advice. I informed my close friends and family about the situation, and they were incredibly supportive, offering places to stay and accompanying me whenever I needed to go out. I also invested in better home security, installing cameras and changing the locks. A few days later, the police contacted me with an update. They had found evidence that Daniel had been following me for weeks, tracking my movements through social media and possibly even physically tailing me. They assured me they were taking steps to ensure my safety and had issued a warning for him to stay away from me. Despite the steps taken to protect myself, the experience left a lasting impact. I felt violated and vulnerable. The sense of safety I once took for granted shattered. It took time to rebuild my confidence and regain control over my life. With the support of my loved ones, I slowly started to re-establish my routines. I continued to use the dating app, but with much more caution. I became more vigilant about my online presence, ensuring that my personal information was private and only shared with people I trusted. The incident also made me more aware of the importance of digital security. I updated my privacy settings, used stronger passwords, and was careful about the information I shared online. It was a hard lesson, but it taught me to be more mindful of the potential dangers of the digital world. Looking back, I realized that Daniel's actions were not my fault. He had taken advantage of my openness and trust, but I refused to let his behavior dictate my future. I continued to date, meet new people, and live my life, but with a newfound sense of awareness and caution. The experience ultimately made me stronger and more resilient. It reminded me of the importance of trusting my instincts and taking action when something feels wrong. While the memory of Daniel's stalking still lingered, it served as a powerful reminder to always prioritize my safety and well-being in both the physical and digital realms. Story 27 Moving to a new city was both exciting and nerve-wracking. I had accepted a new job and was eager to start fresh in a place full of possibilities. After weeks of searching online, I finally found a quaint one-bedroom apartment in a historic neighborhood. The rent was reasonable, and the landlord, Mr. Bennett, seemed friendly and accommodating. When I first toured the apartment, Mr. Bennett was there to show me around. He was an older man, probably in his late sixties, with a kind smile and a grandfatherly demeanor. The apartment was charming, with hardwood floors, large windows, and a cozy layout. I felt an immediate sense of comfort and agreed to sign the lease on the spot. The first few weeks in my new home were wonderful. I enjoyed exploring the city, meeting new people, and settling into my job. The apartment quickly became my sanctuary, a place where I could relax and unwind after long days. One evening, about a month after moving in, I decided to rearrange the furniture in the living room. As I was moving the bookshelf, I noticed a small, black device tucked behind it. Curious, I picked it up and examined it closely. It was a camera, the kind used for home security. My heart skipped a beat as I realized it was pointed directly at the couch where I often sat. I felt a wave of nausea. 
Why would there be a camera in my apartment? Had Mr. Bennett installed it? My mind raced with possibilities, none of them comforting. I began to search the rest of the apartment, my anxiety mounting with each step. In the bedroom, I found another camera hidden behind a potted plant, and in the bathroom, one concealed in the vent. Panic set in. How long had these cameras been there? How much had they recorded? I felt violated and exposed, the sense of security I had cherished shattered in an instant. I grabbed my phone and called my best friend, Emily, explaining the situation in a trembling voice. Get out of there right now, she urged. Come stay with me until we figure this out. I quickly packed a bag and left the apartment, my heart pounding. I felt a mix of fear, anger, and betrayal. Mr. Bennett had seemed so kind and trustworthy, but now I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched and exploited. At Emily's place, we discussed what to do next. She suggested we call the police, and I agreed. I filed a report, explaining everything I had found. The officers took my statement seriously and assured me they would investigate. The next day, accompanied by the police, I returned to the apartment. They conducted a thorough search, finding several more hidden cameras in various rooms. Mr. Bennett was brought in for questioning, and it didn't take long for him to confess. He admitted to installing the cameras, claiming they were for security purposes, but it was clear his intentions were far more sinister. The police confiscated the cameras and all recorded footage. Mr. Bennett was arrested and charged with multiple offenses, including invasion of privacy and illegal surveillance. The news of his arrest spread quickly, and the other tenants in the building were equally horrified. Some had lived there for years, never suspecting they were being watched. In the aftermath, I struggled to come to terms with what had happened. The apartment no longer felt like home, it felt like a crime scene. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, even in my friend's safe and welcoming house. Sleep became elusive, and my trust in others was deeply shaken. I decided to take some time off work to process everything and figure out my next steps. Emily and my other friends were incredibly supportive, offering a place to stay and a shoulder to lean on. They reminded me that it wasn't my fault that I had done nothing to deserve such a violation of privacy. With their encouragement, I began looking for a new place to live. This time I was much more cautious. I researched landlords thoroughly, read countless reviews, and asked detailed questions about security measures. I also invested in a camera detector, a small device that could help identify hidden surveillance equipment. The Eventually, I found a new apartment in a different part of the city. It was smaller and less charming than the first, but it felt safe. The landlord, a kind woman named Mrs. Johnson, lived in the building and had a reputation for being respectful and attentive to her tenants. Moving in was a bittersweet experience. I was relieved to leave the tainted memories of the old apartment behind, but the scars of betrayal and invasion remained. It took time, therapy, and the unwavering support of friends to rebuild my sense of security and trust. I also became an advocate for tenant rights, sharing my story to raise awareness about the importance of privacy and the potential dangers of surveillance. I joined a local tenant association and worked with them to push for stricter regulations and penalties for landlords who violated their tenants' privacy. The experience left a lasting impact on me. It made me more vigilant and cautious, but it also highlighted the strength of community and the importance of standing up for what's right. I learned to trust my instincts and to speak out when something felt wrong. As the months passed, I gradually began to feel more at home in my new apartment. I decorated it with personal touches, invited friends over for dinners, and created new, positive memories. The fear and anxiety slowly faded, replaced by a sense of resilience and empowerment. While the memory of the hidden cameras still lingered, it no longer held the power to control my life. 
I had reclaimed my sense of security and found strength in my journey toward healing and advocacy. And though I would always be more cautious, I refused to let the actions of one man define my experience in the city that had become my home. Story 28 Camping alone in a national park had always been a cherished escape for me, a way to disconnect from the hustle and bustle of daily life and immerse myself in nature's tranquility. The vastness of the wilderness, the crispness of the air, and the serene silence broken only by the sounds of wildlife always brought me peace. This time I chose a remote spot in a sprawling national park known for its dense forests and breathtaking vistas. I arrived at my campsite in the late afternoon, setting up my tent and organizing my gear. The sun was beginning to set, casting a warm, golden hue over the landscape. After setting up camp, I decided to take a short hike to explore the area and enjoy the last light of day. The trail wound through towering trees and lush undergrowth, eventually leading to a small clearing with a stunning view of the valley below. As dusk settled in, I made my way back to camp, the sounds of nature growing louder as night approached. I built a small fire, cooked a simple meal, and settled into my camping chair with a book. The peaceful solitude was exactly what I needed. As the fire crackled and the stars began to twinkle overhead, I felt a deep sense of contentment. Later that night I crawled into my tent and drifted off to sleep, the soothing sounds of the forest lulling me into a restful slumber. Sometime in the early hours of the morning, I was abruptly awakened by distant voices and the unmistakable glow of flashlights cutting through the darkness. Groggy and disoriented, I sat up and listened intently. The voices were hushed and tense, coming from somewhere beyond the trees. Curiosity got the better of me, and I quietly unzipped my tent. The night was pitch black, the moon hidden behind a thick layer of clouds. I grabbed my flashlight, making sure to keep it off, and cautiously made my way toward the source of the voices. As I crept through the underbrush, the voices grew louder and more distinct. I soon found myself at the edge of another clearing, partially hidden by a thick stand of trees. What I saw sent a jolt of fear through me. A group of people, about half a dozen, were gathered around a makeshift table covered with various tools and equipment. The flickering light of their lanterns cast eerie shadows on their faces, revealing a mix of anxiety and determination. They were in the process of setting up a large, complex apparatus that I quickly recognized as a methamphetamine lab. The air was thick with the pungent smell of chemicals, and I could see containers of hazardous substances scattered around the site. My heart pounded in my chest as I realized the gravity of the situation. These people were engaging in a highly dangerous and illegal activity, and I was dangerously close to their operation. I knew I had to get out of there before they noticed me. I slowly backed away, careful not to make any noise. My mind raced with thoughts of what could happen if they discovered me. People involved in such activities were often desperate and unpredictable. As I moved further away from the clearing, I accidentally stepped on a dry twig, the loud snap echoing through the forest. The voices abruptly stopped, and I heard someone shout, did you hear that panic surge through me, and I turned and ran, not caring about the noise anymore. Branches whipped against my face and arms as I sprinted through the forest, my only thought to get as far away from them as possible. I reached my campsite, breathless and trembling. There was no way I could stay here, it was too close to their operation, and I couldn't risk being found. I quickly packed up my gear, my hands shaking with fear and adrenaline. Within minutes, I had everything in my backpack, and I doused the fire, leaving no trace of my presence. I started down the trail in the direction of the park entrance, using my flashlight sparingly to avoid drawing attention. Every rustle of leaves and snap of a twig made my heart race, but I pressed on, determined to put as much distance between myself and the dangerous group as possible. 
After what felt like hours of hiking, the first light of dawn began to break through the trees. Exhausted but relieved, I finally reached the park entrance. There was a small ranger station nearby, and I headed straight for it. The ranger on duty looked up in surprise as I burst in, disheveled and out of breath. I need to report something, I said, my voice shaking. There's a group of people setting up a meth lab in the forest. The ranger's expression turned serious, and he quickly called for backup. Within minutes, more rangers arrived, along with law enforcement officers. I gave them a detailed description of what I had seen in the location of the clearing. They assured me they would take immediate action, and thanked me for reporting the illegal activity. One of the rangers offered to drive me to a nearby town, where I could rest and recover from the ordeal. As we drove, I couldn't help but feel a mix of emotions relief that I had escaped unharmed. Anger at the people who had brought such danger into the peaceful forest, and gratitude for the rangers and officers who were taking swift action. The experience left a lasting impression on me. My cherished escape into nature had turned into a harrowing encounter with the darker side of human behavior. It reminded me of the importance of vigilance and the need to report suspicious activities to protect the natural places we love. Despite the terrifying incident, I continued to go camping, but I became more cautious and aware of my surroundings. The wilderness still held its allure, offering solace and peace, but I never forgot the lesson I learned that night in the forest. The balance between the beauty of nature and the potential dangers it could hide made me appreciate the need for both caution and respect for the wild. Story 29 the first phone call came late one evening, just as I was settling into bed. My phone rang, displaying an unknown number. I hesitated, considering letting it go to voicemail, but curiosity got the better of me. Hello, I answered. There was a brief silence before a distorted voice spoke. I know who you are, and I know everything about you. A chill ran down my spine. Who is this? The voice ignored my question and continued. I see you've been working late at the office a lot lately. How's that big project going? My heart pounded. How did this person know about my work schedule? Who are you? What do you want? The line went dead. I sat there, clutching the phone, my mind racing with questions and fear. I tried to brush it off as a prank, but deep down I knew it was something more sinister. The next morning I couldn't shake the unease. I went through my usual routine getting ready for work, commuting to the office, and diving into my tasks but I felt a constant sense of being watched. Every time my phone buzzed I jumped, fearing another call. That evening, as I was leaving the office my phone rang again. It was the same unknown number. My hand trembled as I answered. Hello. Nice outfit, the voice said. The blue dress really suits you. I looked down at my dress, a feeling of violation washing over me. What do you want, I demanded, my voice trembling. I want you to listen, the voice replied calmly. If you go to the police, there will be consequences. Just do as I say, and everything will be fine. The call ended abruptly. I stood there in the empty office parking lot, feeling exposed and vulnerable. I quickly got into my car and drove home, constantly checking my mirrors, half expecting to see someone following me. Over the next few days, the calls continued. Each time, the caller revealed more intimate details about my life where I shopped, what I ate, conversations I had with friends, it became clear that this person was not only watching me but had also somehow gained access to my personal information. I began to feel paranoid and anxious, constantly looking over my shoulder. I changed my routine hoping to throw off whoever was following me, but the calls persisted. They knew about every change, every detail and made sure I knew it. 
desperate. I confided in my best friend, Sarah. She was horrified and insisted I go to the police, despite the caller's threats. Together, we went to the local police station and filed a report. The officers took my statement seriously and assured me they would investigate. For a few days, the calls stopped, and I started to feel a glimmer of hope. Maybe the police presence had scared the caller off, but just as I was beginning to relax, my phone rang again. It was the same unknown number. I told you not to go to the police, the voice said, dripping with menace. Now, you're going to pay. The line went dead. Fear surged through me. I immediately called the police, who promised to send an officer to my house. That night I stayed at Sarah's place, too scared to be alone. The next morning, I found a note slipped under my door at home. It was a chilling message you can't hide from me. The police increased their surveillance and I started staying with friends, never spending more than a night or two in one place. The sense of being hunted was unbearable. I felt like a prisoner, my life dictated by the whims of a faceless tormentor. The days turned into weeks, and the calls continued sporadically, always from different numbers, making them hard to trace. The police were doing everything they could, but the lack of concrete evidence made it difficult to track down the caller. One evening, as I was preparing dinner at Sarah's apartment, my phone buzzed with a new message. It was from an unknown number. My hands shook as I opened it. Meet me at the old warehouse on Pine Street. Come alone, or things will get worse. I showed the message to Sarah and immediately called the police. They devised a plan to catch the caller in the act. I would go to the warehouse, but they would be nearby ready to intervene. The next night I drove to the warehouse, my heart pounding with fear and anticipation. The building was dark and abandoned, its windows boarded up and its entrance covered in graffiti. I parked my car and walked towards the entrance, my breath coming in short, shallow gasps. As I stepped inside, the musty smell of decay filled my nostrils. I took a few cautious steps forward, my eyes scanning the shadows for any sign of movement. Suddenly a figure emerged from the darkness, and the voice that had haunted me for weeks spoke again. You actually came, the voice said, now clear and unfiltered. A man stepped into the dim light, revealing a gaunt face with wild eyes. He looked unhinged, his movements jerky and erratic. Did you really think you could hide from me? I took a step back, trying to keep my composure. Why are you doing this? What do you want from me? He sneered. I want you to feel the same fear I felt when my life fell apart. You have no idea what it's like to lose everything. Before I could respond, the police burst into the warehouse, their flashlights cutting through the darkness. They surrounded the man, shouting commands for him to drop his weapon. He hesitated for a moment, then made a desperate lunge towards me. An officer tackled him to the ground, handcuffing him as he screamed obscenities. Relief and exhaustion washed over me as I watched the officers lead him away. One of the detectives approached me, a reassuring smile on her face. You're safe now, she said. We'll make sure he faces justice. In the days that followed, I tried to piece my life back together. The police discovered that the man had been stalking me for months, using social media and other online platforms to gather information about me. He had even installed spyware on my phone, allowing him to monitor my every move. With the help of the police and a cybersecurity expert, I secured all my devices and took steps to protect my privacy. It was a long and arduous process, but I was determined to reclaim my life. The experience left me shaken, but it also taught me valuable lessons about vigilance and resilience. I became more cautious about what I shared online and more aware of my surroundings. The fear that had once consumed me slowly faded, replaced by a newfound strength. I continued to lean on my friends and family for support, grateful for their unwavering presence. Sarah, 
in particular, had been my rock throughout the ordeal, and our bond grew even stronger. As time passed, I found solace in the knowledge that the man who had tormented me was behind bars, unable to harm me or anyone else. I resumed my daily routines, gradually rebuilding my sense of normalcy. The memory of those terrifying weeks remained with me, a stark reminder of the dangers that can lurk in the shadows, but it also served as a testament to the power of courage, determination, and the importance of never letting fear dictate my life. Story 30 Buying my first house was a milestone I had been dreaming of for years. It was a charming old Victorian home in a quiet neighborhood, the kind of place where everyone knew each other and the kids played in the streets until dusk. Moving day was a whirlwind of activity, but once the boxes were unpacked and the furniture was arranged, I began to feel the warm embrace of home. The house had character, with its creaky wooden floors, intricate moldings, and an attic full of forgotten treasures. One afternoon, while exploring the attic, I stumbled upon an old, dusty trunk hidden in a dark corner. Curiosity peaked. I opened it and found a collection of yellowed papers, old photographs, and to my surprise, a worn leather-bound diary. The diary's cover was cracked and faded, the pages brittle with age. I brought it downstairs and settled into my favorite armchair, intrigued by the secrets it might hold. As I began to read, I realized the diary belonged to the previous owner, a man named Edward Hastings. At first, the entries seemed mundane accounts of daily life, descriptions of the weather, and notes about home repairs. But as I delved deeper, the tone of the diary changed. Edward's writing grew darker, his words laced with anger and bitterness. He wrote about feeling wronged by his neighbors detailing perceived slights and grievances with increasing intensity. It, one particular entry caught my attention. August 3rd, 1997. I cannot stand their smug faces any longer. They think they're better than me, but I'll show them. They'll regret ever crossing me. My heart raced as I continued reading. The diary entries became more disturbing describing in chilling detail how Edward began to exact revenge on those he believed had wronged him. He wrote about slashing tires, poisoning pets, and even setting small fires. The casual, almost gleeful way he recounted these acts sent a shiver down my spine. September 12th, 1997. Tonight I took it a step further. I watched them, waited until they were asleep. It was so easy to break in. They never even knew I was there. The look on their faces when they wake up to the chaos I left behind will be priceless. The further I read, the more horrifying the entries became. Edward described escalating his activities, moving from vandalism to outright violence. He detailed breaking into homes, attacking people in their sleep, and leaving no trace of his presence. His writing was meticulous, recounting each step he took to avoid detection. November 5th, 1997. They still have no idea it's me. I've become a ghost, a shadow. They fear the night now, and it's all because of me. I am unstoppable. I felt sick to my stomach. Edward Hastings had lived in this house, walked these floors, and committed unspeakable acts against his neighbors. The diary ended abruptly in late 1997, with no indication of what happened to him. I realized that Edward had never been caught. The community must have moved on, the memories of his terror fading over time. I debated what to do next. I couldn't keep this to myself, but I also knew that revealing the diary could cause panic and reopen old wounds. I decided to contact the local police and show them the diary. They needed to know the truth about Edward Hastings and his violent past. The police took my concerns seriously. They sent detectives to my house to examine the diary and ask me questions about how I found it. I handed over the diary, my hands shaking. The detectives assured me they would investigate and keep me informed of any developments. 
Over the next few days, the police presence in the neighborhood increased. They began interviewing longtime residents, trying to piece together any information about Edward Hastings and his activities. The diary had sparked a renewed interest in the unsolved crimes from decades ago, and the community buzzed with speculation and fear. One evening, a detective called to update me on the investigation. We've discovered that Edward Hastings disappeared in late 1997, he said. He was never officially reported missing because he had no close family, but we believe he may have died or left the area suddenly. The detective's words brought some relief, but questions still lingered. If Edward had died, where was his body? And if he had left, was he still out there, living under a new identity? The uncertainty was unsettling. As the investigation continued, the police uncovered more evidence linking Edward to several unsolved crimes in the neighborhood. They found his fingerprints at some of the crime scenes and matched his writing style to anonymous threatening letters sent to various residents. The diary had provided the key to solving these cold cases, bringing some measure of closure to the victims. The media caught wind of the story, and soon reporters were camped outside my house, eager for any details. I felt overwhelmed by the attention, but grateful that the truth was finally coming to light. The community rallied together, offering support to those affected by Edward's crimes and working to reclaim the sense of safety that had been shattered so long ago. Despite the resolution of the investigation, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that lingered in my home. The knowledge of what had happened there, of the darkness that had once resided within those walls, weighed heavily on me. I decided it was time to move on. I sold the house and found a new place in a different part of town. It was a fresh start, free from the shadows of the past. I took the lessons I had learned with me, understanding the importance of vigilance and the impact of uncovering hidden truths. The experience left a lasting impression on me. It reminded me of the importance of community and the strength that comes from facing difficult truths together. Though the memory of Edward Hastings and his diary still haunted me, I found solace in knowing that justice had been served and the community had emerged stronger and more united. In my new home, I created new memories and built new connections, always mindful of the past but determined to move forward. The diary, once a symbol of fear and darkness, had ultimately brought light and closure to a community in need. And in that, I found a sense of peace and resolution. Story 31 It was a typical Saturday afternoon and I had just finished my weekly grocery shopping. The parking lot was busy, with families loading their cars and people chatting on their phones. I maneuvered my cart to my car, parked near the back where it was quieter. The sky was overcast, threatening rain, and I was eager to get home before the weather turned worse. As I started loading bags into the trunk, a man approached me. He looked to be in his mid-thirties, with unkempt hair and a disheveled appearance. His clothes were wrinkled, and there was a nervous energy about him. Excuse me, he said, his voice shaky. I'm sorry to bother you, but my car broke down and I need help. Can you give me a ride to the gas station? It's just a few blocks away. I hesitated, glancing around the parking lot. The man seemed genuine enough, and I didn't want to be unkind. Sure, I replied cautiously. Just let me finish loading my groceries, and I'll take you. His face lit up with relief. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I finished loading my groceries, trying to shake off the nagging feeling of unease. I told myself I was just being paranoid. After all, helping someone in need was the right thing to do. Once I was done, I unlocked the car and gestured for him to get in. He slid into the passenger seat, and I got behind the wheel. As soon as I started the engine, his demeanor changed. He pulled out a knife, pressing it against my side. 
drive, he ordered, his voice low and menacing. And don't try anything stupid. My heart pounded in my chest, and my hands shook on the steering wheel. Please don't hurt me, I pleaded. I'll do whatever you want. Just drive, he repeated, his eyes darting around nervously. I pulled out of the parking lot, my mind racing with fear and confusion. I had to find a way to escape, but the knife against my side was a constant reminder of the danger I was in. I drove down the street, following his instructions to take various turns, leading us away from the busy areas and into a more secluded part of town. As we drove, he kept glancing at me, his grip on the knife tightening. You're going to take me to an ATM and withdraw all the money you have, he demanded. Then you're going to keep driving until I say otherwise. I nodded, trying to keep my voice steady. Okay, I'll do it. We approached a gas station with an ATM, and he instructed me to pull over. Remember, if you try to run or call for help, I'll find you, he warned. I nodded, my mind racing with thoughts of escape. I parked the car and slowly got out, feeling his eyes on me the entire time. As I walked towards the ATM, I noticed a small convenience store attached to the gas station. Inside, there were a few customers and a clerk behind the counter. An idea began to form. I reached the ATM and pretended to fumble with my wallet, taking longer than necessary to withdraw the money. I glanced over my shoulder and saw the man watching me from the car, his eyes narrow and suspicious. With my heart pounding, I took the cash from the ATM and walked towards the convenience store instead of returning to the car. I burst through the door, my voice shaking as I shouted help. That man outside has a knife and is trying to kidnap me. The customers and the clerk turned to look at me, their expressions ranging from shock to concern. The clerk quickly grabbed the phone and called the police, while one of the customers, a burly man in a leather jacket, stepped forward. Stay here, he said firmly. I'll handle this. He walked out of the store, and I followed cautiously, peeking through the window. The man with the knife saw him coming and panicked. He jumped out of the car and started to run, but the customer was faster. He tackled the man to the ground, pinning him down until the police arrived. I stood in the doorway, shaking with relief as the officers handcuffed the man and took him away. One of the officers approached me, his expression kind but serious. Are you okay, Mom? He asked. I nodded, tears streaming down my face. Yes, I think so. Thank you. He took my statement, and I recounted the entire ordeal, from the moment the man approached me in the parking lot to my escape into the convenience store. The officer praised my quick thinking and reassured me that the man would be charged with attempted kidnapping and assault. As I drove home, my hands still trembling on the steering wheel, I couldn't help but replay the events in my mind. I had always considered myself cautious and aware of my surroundings, but this incident had shaken me to my core. The realization that danger could strike at any moment, even in broad daylight, was a sobering thought. In the days that followed, I took extra precautions to ensure my safety. I signed up for self-defense classes, installed a panic button app on my phone, and made a point to always be aware of my surroundings. My friends and family were incredibly supportive, offering comfort and reassurance as I worked to regain my sense of security. The experience left a lasting impact on me, serving as a stark reminder of the importance of vigilance and caution. I learned to trust my instincts and to never let my guard down, no matter how safe a situation might seem. Despite the fear and trauma, I refused to let the incident define me. I continued to live my life, but with a heightened awareness and a determination to stay safe. I knew that while I couldn't control the actions of others, I could control my own responses and be prepared for anything. The man who had tried to kidnap me was eventually convicted and sentenced to prison. 
Knowing that he was behind bars brought a measure of closure, but the memory of that day remained with me, a constant reminder of the fragility of safety and the importance of staying vigilant. Over time, I found strength in my resilience and the support of those around me. I became an advocate for personal safety, sharing my story to help others understand the importance of caution and preparedness. The incident had changed me, but it had also empowered me to take control of my own safety and to never take my security for granted. Story 32 When I accepted the job as a live and caretaker for Mrs. Eleanor Whitman, I thought it would be a peaceful respite from the chaos of my previous job in the city. Mrs. Whitman was a sweet, elderly lady living in a large, historic home in a quiet, picturesque town. Her family had placed an ad looking for someone to help her with daily tasks, and it seemed like the perfect opportunity to slow down and enjoy a simpler life. The Whitman house was a sprawling Victorian mansion, complete with creaky wooden floors, antique furniture, and an air of timeless elegance. Mrs. Whitman herself was kind and gentle, with a sharp mind and a warm smile. She quickly welcomed me into her home, and I settled into my new routine of helping her with meals, medication, and light housekeeping. For the first few weeks, everything went smoothly. I enjoyed the tranquility of the house and the quiet rhythm of my days. Mrs. Whitman's family, her son Richard and his wife Laura visited occasionally, always bringing a tense energy that contrasted with the serene atmosphere of the home. They were polite but distant, and I chalked it up to the stress of caring for an elderly parent. One evening, after Mrs. Whitman had gone to bed, I decided to do some reading in the library. The room was filled with old books and family heirlooms, and I loved losing myself in its history. As I reached for a book on the top shelf, a stack of papers slipped out and fell to the floor. I bent down to pick them up and noticed something odd they were financial documents and the amounts listed were staggeringly large. Curiosity peaked. I began to look more closely. The documents detailed transactions and bank accounts with sums of money that didn't match the modest lifestyle of Mrs. Whitman. My heart raced as I realized the papers hinted at something far more sinister than simple family finances. There were references to offshore accounts, shell companies, and large cash deposits that couldn't be explained away easily. I carefully put the papers back and decided to keep an eye out for more information. Over the next few days, I noticed Richard and Laura having hushed conversations whenever they visited, always making sure Mrs. Whitman was out of earshot. They seemed particularly interested in a locked room on the second floor, a room I had assumed was simply storage. One afternoon, while Mrs. Whitman napped, I decided to investigate. I found the key hidden in a drawer in the study and unlocked the door. The room was filled with filing cabinets and a large, imposing desk. On the desk were more financial documents, along with ledgers and notebooks. As I leafed through the papers, a chilling pattern emerged money laundering, fraud, and connections to organized crime. My heart pounded as I realized the extent of Richard and Laura's involvement in illegal activities. They were using Mrs. Whitman's home as a front for their operations, hiding their criminal activities behind the facade of a quiet, respectable family. The implications were terrifying, and I knew I had to be careful. That evening, as I helped Mrs. Whitman with her dinner, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread. She noticed my unease and asked if something was wrong. I hesitated, unsure of how much to tell her. Finally, I decided she deserved to know the truth. Mrs. Whitman, I began cautiously. I found some documents in the house that suggest Richard and Laura might be involved in something illegal. I think they're using your home for their activities. Her eyes widened in shock and disbelief. What are you talking about? Richard and Laura would never do something like that. I know it's hard to believe, I said gently, but the documents are very clear. They're hiding money and conducting business that's not legitimate. 
She sat quietly for a moment, absorbing the news. I never thought. I always believed they were taking care of things. I had no idea. We need to do something, I urged. We can't let them continue this. It's dangerous, and it could put you in harm's way. She nodded slowly. You're right. We need to call the authorities. We contacted the local police, and I shared everything I had found. The police took our concerns seriously and launched an investigation. Richard and Laura were arrested within days, and the full extent of their criminal activities came to light. They had been laundering money for a criminal organization for years, using Mrs. Whitman's home as a cover. The aftermath was difficult for Mrs. Whitman. The shock of discovering her son's betrayal was overwhelming, and she struggled to come to terms with the truth. I stayed with her, providing support and companionship as she navigated the emotional turmoil. The house, once a symbol of safety and family, became a painful reminder of the deception and danger that had lurked within its walls. Mrs. Whitman decided to sell the house and move to a smaller, more manageable place. She found comfort in the close-knit community of a senior living facility, where she could build new relationships and create new memories. Despite the darkness of the situation, there were moments of hope and resilience. Mrs. Whitman's strength in facing the truth and taking action was inspiring, and our bond grew stronger through the ordeal. I continued to care for her, feeling a deep sense of responsibility and affection. The experience left a profound impact on me. It was a stark reminder of how easily appearances can be deceiving and how important it is to trust one's instincts. I learned to be more vigilant and cautious but also more compassionate and supportive. In the end, justice was served and Mrs. Whitman found a new sense of peace and security. The experience brought us closer together, forging a bond that went beyond caretaker and employer. It taught us both valuable lessons about trust, resilience, and the strength to face difficult truths. As time passed, the memory of the Whitman house faded, replaced by the new memories we created in her new home. Mrs. Whitman thrived in her new environment, surrounded by friends and a supportive community. I stayed by her side, grateful for the opportunity to make a positive difference in her life. The lessons I learned from that time stayed with me, shaping my approach to life and work. I remained vigilant, always ready to protect those in my care, and more appreciative of the simple, genuine moments of connection and trust that form the foundation of true relationships. Story 33 Traveling abroad had always been a passion of mine. I loved exploring new cultures, tasting exotic foods, and meeting people from all walks of life. This time I decided to visit a small but vibrant country in Southeast Asia known for its lush landscapes and rich history. The trip had been going smoothly until one fateful evening that changed everything. It was my third day in the country, and I had spent the morning wandering through bustling markets, snapping photos of ancient temples, and enjoying the local cuisine. As the sun began to set, I headed back to my hotel, looking forward to a relaxing evening. Little did I know, my adventure was about to take a dark turn. As I approached the hotel entrance, a group of uniformed officers appeared seemingly out of nowhere, blocking my path. Their stern expressions and the tension in the air immediately put me on edge. One of them stepped forward and spoke in broken English. You are under arrest. Come with us. Panic surged through me. There must be a mistake, I stammered. I haven't done anything wrong. Ignoring my protests, the officers quickly handcuffed me and led me to a waiting police car. My heart raced as they drove me to a nearby police station. I had no idea what was happening or why I was being detained. At the station, I was led into a small, dimly lit interrogation room. A stern-looking officer sat behind a desk, motioning for me to sit. We have reason to believe you are involved in criminal activities, he said, 
his voice devoid of emotion. Your passport matches the description of a fugitive we are looking for. I was stunned. There must be some mistake, I insisted. I'm just a tourist. I have my passport and all my travel documents. Please check them. The officer eyed me suspiciously before nodding to a subordinate who took my passport and left the room. I sat there, my mind racing with fear and confusion. I thought about my family back home and wondered how I could convince the authorities of my innocence. Hours passed and the officer returned with my passport. Your passport appears to be genuine, he said, his tone slightly less hostile. But we need to verify your identity further. You will remain in custody until we can confirm you are not the person we are looking for. Desperation filled me. Please, can I make a phone call? I need to contact my embassy. The officer hesitated but eventually nodded. You have five minutes. I quickly dialed the number for my country's embassy, explaining my situation to the consul. They assured me they would look into the matter and contact the local authorities on my behalf. The call was brief, but it gave me a glimmer of hope. The next few days were a blur of anxiety and frustration. I was kept in a small cell with minimal contact with the outside world. The embassy worked tirelessly to clear up the confusion, but the process was slow. Each day felt like an eternity as I waited for any news that might bring an end to my nightmare. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the consul visited me at the police station. We've made progress, they said, a reassuring smile on their face. We've provided the authorities with sufficient evidence to prove your identity. You should be released soon. Relief washed over me but it was tempered by the anger and frustration of having been detained for something I hadn't done. I thanked the consul profusely, grateful for their assistance. A few hours later, the officer who had interrogated me returned. You are free to go, he said, his tone more respectful than before. We apologize for the inconvenience. It appears there was a misunderstanding. I was escorted out of the police station my belongings returned to me. The consul offered to take me back to the hotel, and I gratefully accepted. During the ride, they explained that the fugitive the authorities were looking for had used a counterfeit passport with details strikingly similar to mine. It was an unfortunate coincidence, but one that had caused me immense distress. Back at the hotel, I tried to resume my trip but the experience had left a lasting impact on me. I couldn't shake the feeling of vulnerability and fear that had settled over me during my detention. The thought of being mistaken for someone else and losing my freedom so easily was terrifying. Despite the ordeal, I was determined not to let it ruin my trip. I took extra precautions, keeping in close contact with the embassy and being more vigilant about my surroundings. Slowly, I began to enjoy my travels again, although the memory of my detention never fully faded. The experience taught me several valuable lessons. I learned the importance of being prepared for any situation, no matter how unlikely it might seem. I also gained a deeper appreciation for the support and protection offered by my embassy, and the importance of having access to their resources while traveling abroad. As the days passed, I found solace in the beauty and resilience of the country I was visiting. I continued to explore its wonders, meet its people, and immerse myself in its culture. The initial fear and anxiety gradually gave way to a renewed sense of adventure and curiosity. When I finally returned home, I shared my story with friends and family, emphasizing the importance of being cautious and prepared while traveling. My experience served as a stark reminder of how quickly things can go wrong, but also of the strength and resilience we can find within ourselves in times of crisis. Looking back, I realized that my ordeal had made me a more cautious and aware traveler. It had also deepened my appreciation for the freedoms I often took for granted. The world is full of unpredictable situations, but with vigilance, preparation, and a little help from those who care, 
we can navigate through even the darkest of times. The incident abroad, though harrowing, became a chapter in my life that taught me resilience and the value of staying calm under pressure. And while I would always carry the memory of those tense days, it was a reminder of the importance of perseverance and the enduring spirit of adventure that drove me to explore the world in the first place. Story 34 Waking up to find my front door wide open was a shock that sent a chill down my spine. It was a Saturday morning, and I had planned to sleep in after a long week at work. The sun was just beginning to rise, casting a pale light into my bedroom. I rubbed my eyes and stretched, but something felt off. A cold draft blew into the room, which was unusual since I always locked up before bed. I got out of bed and walked to the living room, my heart pounding. There was the front door, wide open. My mind raced with fear and confusion. Had I forgotten to lock it? Had someone broken in while I slept? The thought of a stranger walking through my house while I was unconscious filled me with dread. I slowly approached the door, peeking outside. The quiet neighborhood looked the same as always, the early morning light casting long shadows on the empty street. I closed the door and locked it, then took a deep breath to steady myself. I needed to check the house to see if anything was missing or out of place. I started with the living room. Nothing seemed disturbed. The TV was still in its spot, and my laptop was on the coffee table where I had left it. I moved to the kitchen, my eyes scanning for any signs of intrusion. Again, everything appeared normal. Next I checked the other rooms. The bathroom, spare bedroom, and study all untouched. I was starting to think that maybe I had just forgotten to lock the door after all, but then I reached my bedroom. The closet door was ajar, which was strange because I always kept it closed. I opened it fully and gasped. My jewelry box was open, and several pieces were missing. My heart sank. Someone had definitely been inside my house. They had been in my bedroom while I slept, mere feet away from me. The realization sent a wave of nausea through me. I grabbed my phone and called the police. My hands trembled as I explained the situation, and they assured me that officers would be on their way. While I waited, I called my neighbor, Mrs. Thompson, an elderly woman who had lived next door for as long as I could remember. She was always up early and might have seen something. Mrs. Thompson answered on the second ring. Good morning, dear. How are you? Not great, Mrs. Thompson, I replied, my voice shaky. Someone broke into my house last night. Did you happen to see or hear anything unusual? Oh my goodness. Are you okay, she exclaimed. I didn't see anything, but I'll check my security cameras right away. You stay put, and I'll be right over. Mrs. Thompson had installed security cameras around her property a few years ago after a string of break-ins in the neighborhood. I had always thought they were a bit excessive, but now I was grateful for her vigilance. A few minutes later, Mrs. Thompson knocked on my door, her face filled with concern. I checked the footage, she said, handing me a USB drive. I didn't see anyone, but you should show this to the police. Maybe they'll find something I missed. I thanked her and waited for the police to arrive. When they did, I handed over the USB drive and walked them through the house, showing them the open door, the disturbed closet, and the missing jewelry. They took notes and dusted for fingerprints, their presence both reassuring and unsettling. One of the officers, a kind-looking woman named Officer Davis, sat with me in the living room as her partner continued to investigate. It's possible that the intruder was scared off and didn't have time to take more, she said gently. We'll review the footage from your neighbor's cameras and see if we can identify anyone. I nodded, still feeling shaken. I can't believe someone was in my house while I was sleeping. It's terrifying. I understand, Officer Davis said sympathetically. It's a violation of your personal space, 
and it's normal to feel scared. We'll do everything we can to catch the person responsible. The rest of the day passed in a blur. The police reviewed the footage from Mrs. Thompson's cameras but didn't find any clear images of the intruder. They did, however, spot a shadowy figure moving towards my house around 2 a.m. It wasn't much, but it was something. I spent the day securing my house, adding extra locks to the doors and windows and even installing a security system. My friends and family called to check on me, offering support and advice. Despite their reassurances, the sense of violation lingered. That night, sleep was elusive. Every creak of the house, every rustle of the wind, set my nerves on edge. I kept replaying the events in my mind, wondering who could have done this and why. The fear of the unknown weighed heavily on me. Over the next few days, the police continued their investigation, but there were no new leads. The intruder had left no fingerprints, and the shadowy figure on the camera footage was too indistinct to identify. The case remained open, but without more evidence there was little they could do. I tried to resume my normal routine, but the fear lingered. I found myself double-checking locks, peeking out windows and jumping at every unexpected sound. It was exhausting, but I refused to let the intruder take away my sense of security. Gradually, with the support of my friends, family and neighbors, I began to reclaim my home. I enrolled in a self-defense class to build my confidence and learn more about home security measures. Each step I took made me feel a little stronger, a little more in control. One evening, a few weeks after the break-in, I received a call from Officer Davis. We have a suspect in custody, she said. A man was caught breaking into another house nearby, and he matches the description of the figure on your neighbor's camera footage. We found some of your jewelry in his possession. Relief washed over me. Thank you, I said, my voice trembling with emotion. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Officer Davis replied. We'll need you to come down to the station to identify your belongings and give a statement. At the police station, I identified my missing jewelry and learned more about the suspect. He had a history of break-ins and had been targeting houses in the area for weeks. Knowing that he was behind bars brought a sense of closure and renewed my sense of safety. Returning home that night, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. The fear that had haunted me since the break-in began to dissipate. I knew I would always be more cautious, but I also knew that I had the strength and support to overcome any challenge. The experience had taught me valuable lessons about vigilance and resilience. It had shown me the importance of community and the power of taking control of my own safety. Most importantly, it had reminded me that even in the face of fear, I could find the strength to persevere and reclaim my sense of security. Story 35 It was a quiet Sunday evening and I was home alone, enjoying a relaxing night with a good book and a cup of tea. The day had been peaceful and the serene atmosphere of my suburban home was comforting. As the sun set and the shadows lengthened, I curled up on the couch, absorbed in my novel. Little did I know, my sense of security was about to be shattered. Around 9 p.m., I heard a noise that made me sit up alert. It was a faint sound, almost like a window being opened. My heart skipped a beat as I strained to listen. There it was again, a soft but unmistakable creak. Panic surged through me. I lived alone, and there shouldn't have been anyone else in the house. I quickly turned off the living room lamp, plunging the room into darkness. My mind raced with fear and adrenaline as I tried to think of what to do. I grabbed my phone and crept towards the kitchen, where the sound had come from. As I peeked around the corner, my worst fears were confirmed. Two men, dressed in dark clothing with masks covering their faces, were climbing through the kitchen window. I stifled a gasp and backed away slowly, trying to stay as quiet as possible. I needed to hide, and fast. 
The nearest room was the small guest bedroom down the hall. I slipped inside and closed the door softly, my hands trembling. The closet seemed like the best option so I crouched down and slipped inside, pulling the door closed behind me. My heart pounded in my chest, and I could hear the intruders moving through the house, their footsteps heavy and deliberate. They were talking in low voices, and I could make out bits and pieces of their conversation. Check the living room, one of them said. I'll take the bedrooms. I held my breath, praying they wouldn't find me. My phone was clutched tightly in my hand, but I was too afraid to call the police. The sound might give away my hiding spot. Instead, I quickly typed out a text message to my neighbor, Mrs. Thompson explaining the situation and asking her to call the police for me. I hit send and waited, every second feeling like an eternity. The footsteps grew louder as one of the intruders entered the hallway. I could hear him opening doors and rummaging through drawers. He was getting closer. I tried to steady my breathing, pressing myself against the back wall of the closet, hoping the darkness would conceal me. Suddenly, the door to the guest bedroom creaked open. I bit my lip to keep from making a sound. The intruder's footsteps were slow and deliberate as he moved around the room, searching for anything of value. He opened the closet door, and I felt a surge of terror. I could see his shadowy figure outlined against the dim light from the hallway. He reached into the closet, rifling through clothes and boxes, but miraculously, he didn't notice me crouched in the corner. After what felt like an eternity, he moved on, closing the closet door and leaving the room. I exhaled slowly, relief flooding through me. Minutes later, I heard the sound of sirens in the distance. My heart leapt with hope. Mrs. Thompson had received my message and called the police. The intruders must have heard the sirens too, because I could hear them scrambling and cursing. Let's get out of here, one of them shouted. Their footsteps pounded through the house as they made their escape. I waited, counting the seconds until I was sure they were gone. The sound of the front door slamming shut was followed by silence. I emerged from the closet, my legs shaky and my hands still trembling. I made my way to the front of the house, where the blue and red lights of the police cars flashed outside. Officers were already on the scene, guns drawn, searching for the intruders. I ran to the door and flung it open, relief washing over me at the sight of the police. One of the officers approached me, his expression serious but kind. Are you okay, Ma'am? he asked. I nodded, my voice shaky. Yes, I think so. They're gone. They went out the back. The officer nodded and radioed the information to his colleagues. Within minutes, the police had surrounded the area, searching for the intruders. I watched from my front porch, wrapped in a blanket one of the officers had given me as they combed the neighborhood. Mrs. Thompson rushed over, her face filled with concern. Oh dear, are you alright, she asked, hugging me tightly. I nodded, tears streaming down my face. Thank you for calling the police. I don't know what would have happened if you hadn't. She patted my back reassuringly. You're safe now. That's all that matters. The police continued their search, and after a tense hour they apprehended the two men a few blocks away. They were caught trying to flee the area, and the stolen items from my house were found in their possession. The officers assured me that they would be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. In the days that followed, I struggled to regain my sense of security. The thought of strangers invading my home while I slept haunted me, and I found it difficult to sleep at night. I took steps to increase my home security, installing new locks, an alarm system, and even security cameras. The community rallied around me offering support and reassurance. Friends and neighbors checked in on me regularly, and I found comfort in their kindness. I also sought help from a therapist, 
who helped me process the trauma and rebuild my sense of safety. Over time, the fear began to subside, replaced by a renewed sense of resilience and determination. I refused to let the intruder's actions define my life or take away my peace of mind. I continued to make my home a safe and welcoming place, surrounding myself with the things and people that brought me joy. The experience left a lasting impact on me, a reminder of how quickly life can change and the importance of being prepared. But it also taught me about the strength of community and the power of support in overcoming adversity. As I moved forward, I carried the lessons I had learned with me, always mindful of the need for vigilance but also confident in my ability to face whatever challenges came my way. My home became a symbol of my resilience, a place where I had faced fear and emerged stronger for it. Story 36 It was a Friday night, and after a long week at work, I decided to unwind with a few friends at a bar downtown. The bar was lively, filled with the sounds of laughter and clinking glasses. We found a cozy corner, ordered drinks, and settled in for a night of catching up and enjoying each other's company. As the evening wore on, I noticed a man at the bar who seemed to be watching me. At first I brushed it off, thinking he was just people watching like everyone else. But as the night progressed, his gaze lingered a little too long and I started to feel uneasy. I mentioned it to my friends, who assured me it was probably nothing, but I couldn't shake the feeling. Around midnight, we decided to call it a night. My friends and I said our goodbyes outside the bar, and I began my walk home. I lived just a few blocks away, so I usually enjoyed the short stroll. Tonight, though, the streets felt darker and the air colder. I glanced over my shoulder, half expecting to see the man from the bar, but the street seemed empty. I quickened my pace, eager to get home and out of the night's unsettling grip. As I turned the corner onto my street, I heard footsteps behind me. My heart raced and I forced myself to stay calm. Maybe it was just someone else heading home. I turned my head slightly and saw him the man from the bar. He was following me, his pace matching mine. Panic set in. I dug into my purse for my keys, ready to make a dash for my apartment building. I reached the entrance, fumbling with the lock, my hands shaking. Finally, I managed to unlock the door and slip inside, shutting it quickly behind me. I breathed a sigh of relief, but the sense of safety was short-lived. I rushed up the stairs to my apartment, locking the door behind me and double-checking all the windows. I peeked through the peephole and saw the man standing outside the building, looking up at my window. My heart pounded as I realized he knew where I lived. I quickly grabbed my phone and called the police, explaining the situation in a trembling voice. The dispatcher assured me that officers were on their way and told me to stay inside and lock the doors. I hung up and paced the living room, my mind racing with fear and scenarios of what might happen next. I heard a faint noise at the door and realized with horror that the man was trying to break in. I grabbed a kitchen knife, my hands shaking, and positioned myself behind the couch, ready to defend myself if necessary. The minutes felt like hours as I listened to the sounds of someone tampering with the lock. Then, suddenly the noise stopped. I heard the distant wail of sirens growing louder. I peeked through the peephole again and saw the man retreating down the street. Relief washed over me, but I knew it wasn't over yet. The police arrived shortly after, their flashing lights casting eerie shadows on the walls. I opened the door, my voice shaking as I recounted the events of the night. The officers took my statement and promised to patrol the area throughout the night. They also advised me to install additional locks and consider getting a security system. After the police left, I felt a mixture of relief and lingering fear. The thought that someone had followed me home and tried to break into my apartment was terrifying. I knew I needed to take steps to protect myself and regain a sense of security. The next day, I called a locksmith 
and had additional deadbolts installed on my door. I also purchased a security camera and alarm system, determined to make my apartment as safe as possible. My friends were supportive, offering to stay with me or have me stay with them until I felt safe again. Their concern and kindness were a comfort during this unsettling time. Over the next few weeks, I took extra precautions when going out, always making sure someone knew where I was and when I would be back. I also started carrying pepper spray in my purse, a small but reassuring measure of protection. The experience left a lasting impact on me. I became more vigilant and aware of my surroundings, especially when walking alone at night. The fear and anxiety gradually faded, replaced by a sense of empowerment and determination to stay safe. One evening, a few months after the incident, I received a call from the police. They had apprehended a suspect who matched the description of the man who had followed me. He had been arrested for attempting to break into another apartment in the neighborhood. Knowing he was behind bars brought a sense of closure and relief. The incident taught me valuable lessons about personal safety and the importance of trusting my instincts. It also reinforced the need for a strong support system. My friends and family had been my rock during that difficult time, and I was grateful for their unwavering support. While the fear of that night would always linger in my memory, I refused to let it control my life. I continued to enjoy my evenings out, but with a newfound caution and awareness. The experience made me stronger and more resilient, and I knew that I could face whatever challenges came my way. In the end, I turned a terrifying experience into an opportunity for growth and empowerment. I took control of my safety, learned to trust my instincts, and surrounded myself with people who cared about me. And with each passing day, I felt more confident and secure, ready to face the world on my own terms. Story 37 Starting a new job always comes with a mix of excitement and anxiety. I had recently been hired as an administrative assistant at a mid-sized marketing firm, and I was eager to prove myself. The office was modern and bustling, filled with energetic and driven professionals. I quickly settled into my role, managing schedules, organizing files, and ensuring the smooth operation of the office. It was during my second month on the job that I stumbled upon something unusual. I was tasked with organizing old financial records and client contracts, a mundane but necessary task. As I sifted through the documents, I noticed discrepancies in several client accounts. Large sums of money were being transferred to what seemed like shell companies, and the invoices appeared suspiciously similar, almost as if they had been duplicated with slight variations. At first, I thought it might be a clerical error. However, the more I dug into the records, the clearer it became that something was seriously wrong. The patterns were too consistent to be a mistake. I flagged the documents and decided to bring them to my supervisor, Mr. Collins, a stern but fair manager. When I approached Mr. Collins with my findings, he seemed interested but not overly concerned. I'll look into it, he said, taking the folder from me. Good catch. Just focus on your other tasks for now. Days turned into weeks, and I heard nothing further about the issue. Curiosity and a growing sense of unease gnawed at me. One evening, staying late to finish up some work, I decided to take another look at the financial records. I discovered even more suspicious transactions in a series of emails between upper management that hinted at a cover-up. The next morning, I went to Mr. Collins again, this time with a more comprehensive report. His reaction was different this time he seemed agitated and dismissive. I told you, I'll handle it, he snapped. This is above your pay grade. Focus on your assigned tasks. Feeling brushed off and more suspicious than ever, I confided in a colleague, Sarah, who had been with the company for several years. Sarah's face paled as I explained what I had found. You need to be careful, she warned. 
I've heard rumors about some shady dealings, but no one has ever dared to dig too deep. People who ask too many questions don't last long here. Her warning sent chills down my spine. That night I received an anonymous text message, stop snooping, or you'll regret it, fear surged through me, but so did determination. I couldn't ignore what I had found, even if it meant putting myself at risk. The next day, I approached HR, providing them with all the evidence I had gathered. They promised to investigate, but I could see the hesitation in their eyes. I left the office that evening with a knot of anxiety in my stomach. The threats escalated. I began receiving menacing phone calls and found my car vandalized in the parking lot. The stress was overwhelming, but I knew I couldn't back down. I contacted a friend of mine who was a lawyer and explained the situation. He advised me to document everything and consider going to the authorities. One evening as I was leaving the office I noticed a dark SUV following me. Panic set in and I took a series of random turns trying to lose the vehicle. Eventually I managed to shake them off and made it home, my heart pounding. The fear was becoming unbearable but I couldn't let them intimidate me into silence. The following morning I went to the police and filed a report, providing them with all the evidence of the financial discrepancies and the threats I had received. They took my case seriously and assured me they would investigate. The police presence around my home and the office was a comfort, but the tension remained high. As the investigation unfolded, more employees came forward with their own suspicions and stories of intimidation. It became clear that the scam operation was extensive, involving several high-ranking officials in the company. The media caught wind of the story, and soon it was all over the news. The pressure mounted on the company's leadership and several executives were arrested. The scam involved embezzling funds from clients and laundering money through shell companies. It was a complex and well-orchestrated operation that had been running for years. With the company in turmoil, many employees, including myself, were uncertain about the future. I decided to resign, feeling that the environment had become too toxic and unsafe. I needed a fresh start, away from the corruption and fear. In the weeks that followed, I received several job offers from companies impressed by my integrity and bravery. I accepted a position at a reputable firm that valued transparency and ethical practices. The experience had left scars, but it also taught me valuable lessons about resilience and the importance of standing up for what is right. Looking back, I realized that uncovering the scam had not only exposed the corruption within the company but also highlighted the need for vigilance and accountability in the workplace. The threats and intimidation had been terrifying but they had also shown me the strength I didn't know I had. In my new job, I continued to advocate for transparency and ethical behavior, determined to create a positive and honest work environment. The experience had changed me, but it had also empowered me to fight for what is right, no matter the cost. Story 38 One rainy evening, as I was walking home from work, I stumbled upon a stray dog huddled under a bus stop shelter. The poor creature was drenched and shivering, its eyes filled with a mix of fear and hope. I couldn't just leave it there in the rain, so I gently approached and extended my hand. The dog, a medium-sized brown mutt with soulful eyes, hesitated for a moment before inching closer to sniff my hand. I could see it was in desperate need of food and shelter. Come on. Boy, I coaxed softly, hoping it would follow me home. To my relief, the dog stood up on shaky legs and trotted behind me. Once we reached my apartment, I dried him off with a towel, gave him some leftovers, and made a cozy bed for him in the corner of my living room. He devoured the food gratefully, and soon settled into the makeshift bed, his eyes drooping with exhaustion. I decided to name him Buddy. Over the next few days, Buddy and I grew close. He followed me everywhere, and his playful antics brought joy to my otherwise routine life. I took him to the vet to check for a microchip, but there was none. 
He was healthy, though a bit underweight, and I made sure to provide him with good food and lots of love. One evening, while walking Buddy in the nearby park, a man approached us. He was tall and muscular, with a hardened expression that sent a chill down my spine. His eyes zeroed in on Buddy, and he stopped abruptly. That's my dog, he declared, his voice rough and intimidating. I instinctively pulled Buddy closer to me. I found him as a stray, I replied cautiously. He didn't have a collar or a microchip. The man's expression darkened. He ran away. Give him back. I hesitated, sensing something off about the man. Do you have any proof that he's yours? His face contorted with anger. I don't need to prove anything to you. Hand over the dog, or you'll regret it. Buddy whimpered, pressing against my leg. I'm not giving him to you without proof, I said firmly, my heart pounding. The man took a threatening step forward, but before he could do anything, a jogger passed by, glancing curiously at the tense situation. The man paused, glaring at me before turning away and muttering, this isn't over. I watched him disappear into the darkness, my mind racing with fear. I hurried back to my apartment, constantly checking over my shoulder. Once inside, I locked the door and double-checked all the windows. I knew I had to be cautious, that man seemed dangerous. That night I barely slept, listening for any sounds that might indicate trouble. The next morning I contacted the local animal shelter and the police, explaining the situation and providing a description of the man. The police took note but advised me to stay vigilant. For days passed without incident, and I started to relax, thinking maybe the man had given up. But one night, I woke to the sound of breaking glass. My heart leaped into my throat as I realized someone was trying to break into my apartment. I quickly grabbed my phone and called 911, whispering my address and the situation to the operator. Buddy barked furiously, and I could hear the intruder cursing. I locked myself and Buddy in the bedroom, praying the police would arrive soon. The sounds of the intruder rummaging through my living room sent waves of terror through me. I kept the phone to my ear, the operator reassuring me that help was on the way. Minutes felt like hours, but finally I heard the wail of sirens. The intruder must have heard them too because the noise stopped abruptly. I stayed put, holding Buddy close as I listened to the police announcing their arrival. After what felt like an eternity, there was a knock on my bedroom door. It's the police. You can come out now. I opened the door cautiously, relief flooding over me as I saw the officers standing in my living room. They had arrested the man, who turned out to be the same one from the park. He had a history of violence and illegal activities, and it seemed Buddy had escaped from a very bad situation. The police assured me the man would be facing serious charges and would not be a threat to me or Buddy anymore. They praised me for my quick thinking and reassured me that I had done the right thing by standing my ground and calling for help. In the days that followed, I worked to repair the damage to my apartment and tried to move past the fear. Buddy remained by my side, a constant reminder of the strength and courage I had found in the face of danger. I took extra precautions to ensure our safety, installing new locks and even a security system. The experience left a lasting mark on me. I learned the importance of trusting my instincts and standing up for what I believed was right, even when faced with intimidation. Buddy had come into my life unexpectedly, bringing joy and companionship, and I was determined to protect him as fiercely as he had protected me that night. With time, the fear faded, replaced by a deep sense of resilience and gratitude. Buddy and I continued to build our life together, each day a testament to the bond we shared and the challenges we had overcome. The night of the break-in had been terrifying but it had also shown me the power of courage 
and the unbreakable connection between a person and their beloved pet. Story 39 Volunteering at the local shelter had always been a source of fulfillment for me. The shelter was a refuge for those down on their luck, offering food, clothing, and a warm place to sleep. Every Saturday I spent my afternoons there, helping serve meals and organizing donations. The sense of community and purpose I found within those walls was unmatched. One chilly autumn day, as I was setting up the dining area for dinner service, a new face walked in. His presence immediately set me on edge. He was tall, with a lean build and sharp features that had once been all too familiar to me. My heart sank as I recognized him, Jake, a figure from my past I had hoped never to see again. Years ago, Jake and I had been involved in a tumultuous relationship. He was charming and persuasive, but also manipulative and controlling. It had taken me a long time to break free from his grip, and the scars from our time together still lingered. Seeing him here, in what I considered a safe haven, sent a wave of dread through me. Jake's eyes scanned the room, and when they landed on me, a slow, unsettling smile spread across his face. He walked over, his posture relaxed, but his eyes cold. Well, if it isn't Emily, he said smoothly. Long time no see. I forced a polite smile, my mind racing. Jake, what brings you here? Just looking for a fresh start, he replied, his tone casual. Funny running into you here, though. Small world, huh? I nodded, unsure of what to say. The shelter was a place of refuge, and I didn't want to cause a scene. Yeah, small world. Over the next few days, Jake became a regular at the shelter. He volunteered for various tasks, always positioning himself close to me. His presence was suffocating, and I couldn't shake the feeling that he was here for more than just a fresh start. One evening, after most of the volunteers had left, Jake cornered me in the storage room. Emily, he said, his voice low and menacing. We need to talk. I took a step back, my heart pounding. There's nothing to talk about, Jake. He moved closer, his expression darkening. You think you can just pretend we never happened? That you can move on and forget everything? I have moved on, I replied, my voice shaking. You need to leave me alone. Jake's eyes flashed with anger. You always were stubborn. But this time, things are going to be different. Fear surged through me, but I refused to back down. If you don't leave me alone, I'll go to the police. He laughed, the sound chilling. Go ahead. But remember, I know things about you. Things that could ruin you. His words sent a jolt of terror through me. Jake had always been good at finding ways to manipulate and control. I needed to find a way to protect myself without causing a scene that could hurt the shelter and the people who relied on it. The next day, I confided in the shelter's director, Karen. She was a kind and understanding woman, always ready to support her volunteers. I told her everything about my past with Jake and my fears about his presence at the shelter. Karen listened carefully her expression growing more concerned with each word. Emily, I'm so sorry you're going through this. We can't let him intimidate you. I'll talk to him, and if necessary, we'll involve the authorities. True to her word, Karen confronted Jake that evening, insisting that he leave the shelter. His reaction was explosive. He yelled and threatened, but Karen stood firm. She called the police, who arrived quickly and escorted him out of the building. I thought that would be the end of it, but Jake's threats didn't stop. He left messages on my phone, sent emails, and even tried to follow me home one night. The sense of fear and violation was overwhelming, and I knew I had to take action to protect myself. With Karen's support, I obtained a restraining order against Jake. The shelter also increased security measures, ensuring that he could no longer gain access to the building. 
The police were informed of his harassment and they kept a close watch on the situation. Despite the precautions, the fear lingered. I found it difficult to sleep, constantly checking the locks and windows, always looking over my shoulder. My friends and family rallied around me, offering support and reassurance, but the shadow of Jake's presence was hard to shake. One evening, a few weeks later, I received a call from the police. They had arrested Jake for violating a restraining order and stalking another woman. The news brought a mix of relief and sadness. I was relieved that he was finally behind bars, but I couldn't help but feel for his other victim. The experience left a lasting impact on me. It reminded me of the importance of vigilance and the strength it takes to stand up to those who seek to control and intimidate. I continued to volunteer at the shelter, determined not to let Jake's actions take away the sense of purpose and community I found there. With time, the fear began to fade, replaced by a renewed sense of resilience. I took self-defense classes and surrounded myself with supportive friends and family. The shelter remained a place of refuge, not just for those in need, but for me as well. Jake's return had been a terrifying ordeal, but it had also shown me the strength I had within. I refused to let him or anyone else dictate my life. Instead, I chose to move forward, empowered by the support of my community and the knowledge that I could face whatever challenges came my way. Story 40 Selling things online had always been a straightforward way for me to declutter and make a little extra cash. I had never had any issues before. So when I posted an old laptop for sale on a popular classifieds website, I didn't think twice about it. Within a few hours, I received a message from a potential buyer who seemed genuinely interested. They wanted to meet that evening at a nearby cafe, a public place where I had met buyers before without any trouble. The buyer's name was Alex, and their messages were polite and straightforward. We agreed on a price and I packed the laptop in its original box, making sure everything was in order. As I headed out, I texted a friend about my plans, something I did out of habit for safety reasons. The cafe was busy when I arrived, filled with the usual evening crowd. I found a table near the entrance and waited, scanning the faces around me for anyone who might be looking for me. After a few minutes, a man approached. He was in his early thirties, casually dressed, with an air of confidence. Emily, he asked, and I nodded. I'm Alex. Thanks for meeting me here. No problem, I replied, offering a smile. Here's the laptop. It's in great condition, and I've included all the accessories. Alex examined the laptop briefly, then looked up and smiled. Looks good. Mind if we go outside to finalize the payment? It's a bit crowded in here. I hesitated for a moment, but then nodded. The cafe was busy, and I figured it might be easier to complete the transaction outside. We walked out together, and he led me to a side street next to the cafe. As soon as we were away from the crowd, I felt a sudden rush of unease. Here's fine, I said. Stopping a few steps into the alley, we can finish up here. Alex nodded and reached into his pocket, but instead of pulling out his wallet, he produced a small, concealed knife. My heart pounded in my chest as the realization hit me this was a setup. Give me the laptop and your wallet, he demanded, his voice cold and menacing. Fear surged through me, but I tried to stay calm. Take the laptop, I said handing it over. Just please let me go. He grabbed the laptop with one hand while keeping the knife pointed at me. Your wallet too, he insisted. I reached into my bag and handed over my wallet, my mind racing with thoughts of how to escape. He snatched it from me, rifling through it quickly. Just as I was about to plead for my safety again, I heard footsteps approaching. Hey, what's going on here? A voice called out. I turned to see a man and woman walking towards us. They looked concerned and wary, 
but their presence was enough to make Alex nervous. None of your business, Alex snapped, but his grip on the knife wavered. The couple didn't back down. We're calling the police, the woman said firmly, pulling out her phone. Alex cursed under his breath, glancing around anxiously. He shoved the laptop back at me and threw my wallet to the ground. You got lucky, he hissed before turning and running down the alley. My hands trembled as I picked up my wallet, relief flooding over me. The man and woman approached, concern etched on their faces. Are you okay, the man asked. I think so, I replied, my voice shaky. Thank you, you scared him off. The woman nodded, her phone still in hand. We need to report this. Let's go back to the cafe where it's safe. We walked back to the cafe together, and the couple stayed with me while I called the police. I gave my statement, describing Alex and the events that had just unfolded. The officers assured me they would do everything they could to track him down. The couple, whose names were Jack and Laura, stayed with me until the police finished taking my statement. Their kindness and support were a comfort in the aftermath of the terrifying encounter. We exchanged numbers, and they promised to check in on me later. In the days that followed, I remained on edge, constantly looking over my shoulder and double-checking my locks. The police kept me updated on their investigation, but there was no immediate news of Alex's capture. My friends and family rallied around me, offering support and reassurance. Determined to prevent anyone else from falling victim to a similar scam, I shared my story online and with local news outlets, highlighting the importance of taking extra precautions when meeting buyers or sellers from online platforms. The response was overwhelming, with many people sharing their own experiences and offering tips on staying safe. I also took steps to improve my personal security, such as meeting buyers only in well-lit, busy public places and always bringing a friend along. My ordeal had left me shaken, but I refused to let fear control my actions. One evening, about a month after the incident, I received a call from the police. They had apprehended Alex during a routine patrol after he was caught trying to rob another person. The relief I felt was immense, knowing he was finally off the streets and unable to harm anyone else. With Alex behind bars, I began to regain my sense of security. The experience had been harrowing, but it had also taught me valuable lessons about vigilance and the importance of trusting my instincts. I continued to sell items online, but always with a heightened sense of awareness and caution. The kindness of strangers, like Jack and Laura, had restored my faith in humanity during a dark time. Their intervention had not only saved me from a potentially dangerous situation, but had also reminded me of the strength that comes from community and support. As time passed, the fear and anxiety gradually faded, replaced by a renewed sense of resilience and determination. I had faced a terrifying situation and come out stronger on the other side. The experience had changed me, but it had also empowered me to take control of my safety and live my life without fear.